Ladies and gentlemen, and all genders, thank you for attending the joint webinar held by the Asia and Tokyo Bar Association, titled The Latest Situation of Asian Nations Regarding Data Protection Laws from a Comparative Perspective with GDPR and Chinese Data Protection Laws. I'm Kami Yoshi, uh, Vice Chairperson of International Committee of Tokyo Bar Association. It's my pleasure to serve at today's Master of Ceremony. Today's program will begin with an opening speech by Mr. Osami Yoshida, uh, Vice President, Tokyo Bar Association. And followed by an opening speech, we'll have a session one, uh, data protection laws of Singapore, the Philippines, Japan, and Germany from a comparative perspective with GDPR. Then after a short break, uh, we'll have session two, uh, data protection laws of India, Indonesia, Japan, and China from a comparative perspective with Chinese data protection laws. Finally, Dr. Sanyo Abirani, chairperson of uh, the Communications, Technology, and Data Protection Committee of Low Asia will give a closing remarks. We are grateful to report here that we have over 600 registrations for today's international webinar. Your questions will be answered as needed during the panel discussion part of each session. So if you have any questions, please submit your questions via Zoom chat function. After the webinar, a questionnaire will be displayed, so please answer it. And as for the presentation sheet, uh, I will send you a link to download it via the Zoom chat function by the end of this seminar. This joint seminar is the first in a series of efforts to deepen the relationship between Low Asia and Tokyo Bar Association, following last year's top level meeting between each organization. With that in my mind, I would like to begin this seminar by asking Mr. Osamu Yoshida, Vice President of Tokyo Bar Association, to make an opening speech. So, Vice President, please give an opening speech. <clears throat> Thank you, Kay. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, and all genders, my name is Osamu Yoshida, I'm Vice President of the Tokyo Bar Association. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to hold this joint seminar with Low Asia today. I really hope this joint seminar will help strengthen the relationship between Tokyo Bar Association and Low Asia. Firstly, you know, let me introduce Tokyo Bar Association. Um, Tokyo Bar Association is a regional bar association in Japan. Japan has one local bar association in each jurisdiction of each district court, but Tokyo exceptionally has three bar associations. Tokyo Bar Associations is one of them, but in the most historical one, established in 18, 1880 as Tokyo Daigenin Kumiai, which means Spokes Attorney Union in Japanese and the biggest in Japan. In 2022, Japan had roughly, uh, roughly 43,000 lawyers and Tokyo Bar Association has more than 8,700 members. Because of historical reasons, we very, much respect our independence from the Japanese government. For this reason, we do not accept my uh, do not my uh, accept my subsidies from the Japanese government. We sustain ourselves only with one membership our membership charges. For your information, our membership fee, including our federation charge is currently more than 300 US dollar per month, not per year. You know, independence is variable and expensive. Secondly, we are recently targeting our internationalization. Tokyo Bar Association is promoting the integration of Japanese legal society 
into the globalized, globalized community of legal professionals. This is to meet the complexity of multi-jurisdictional legal matters beyond the boundaries. Also, we have, we have an international committee to contribute to this target. So today's master of ceremony, moderator, and speakers from the side of the Tokyo Bar Association is a member of the international committee of our bar. Tokyo Bar Association is building strong relationships with other local bar associations. We concluded amicable arrangements with the Chicago Bar Association in 2007 and with Paris Bar Association in 2010 and with Hong Kong Bar Association and the Law Society of Hong Kong in uh, 2012, and with Rome Bar Association, the Barcelona Bar Association, Association in uh, 2017. Thankfully, uh, in 2017, Malaysia was so kind enough to host the annual conference in Tokyo as a Japanese regional bar association located in the Asia Pacific, we Tokyo Bar Association also consider cooperation with Low Asia to be very important. To conclude this speech, I'm again deeply grateful to all of you. I wish for the further development of our relationships with Low Asia, for the promising future for Asia Pacific. Japanese relations. Thank you very much for your listening. Vice President, thank you so much for your great speech. Uh, Tokyo Bar Association's move toward interdiction is just exactly in line with today's webinar. Now we would like to move to session one, data protection laws of Singapore, Philippines, Japan, and Germany from a comparative perspective with GDPR. So every speaker, please turn your video on. Yes, yes. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, let me introduce our moderator and speakers of this session. Uh, session one's moderator is uh, Mr. Motoyasu Hirose, partner of Uryu and Itoga from Japan. Also, we have four speakers. Uh, Mr. Henning on Zanthier, partner of Bon Zanthier and Dachaski from Germany. Mr. Shohei Shibuya, uh, associate of Yokogi and Matsi Partners from Japan. Ms. Uh, Maria Concepcion of Simandak del Santos, head of legal and data privacy officer of ING Bank from the Philippines. Ms. Inyu Wang, partner of Digital Business, JWS Asia Law Corporation from Singapore. So, uh, Mr. Motiasu, uh, I'd like to hand over the mic to you. So, please. Uh, thank you very much for your introduction. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Motoyasu Hirose uh, from Japan, also admitted in France. I'm the past vice chair of uh, International Committee of Tokyo Bar Association and also serving as a partner of Uryu Itoga Law Office. Tokyo. So uh, I will serve as a uh, uh, moderator for the first session, uh, comprised of uh, Germany, uh, Japan, uh, Philippines, and Singapore. So uh, in terms of the comparison with GDPR, the starting point of discussion uh, would be uh, the regulations under GDPR. Uh, this is well known uh, as a very strict and reading data privacy laws established in uh, European society. And the reason for uh, this order, Japan, uh, no, Germany, Germany, Japan, Philippines, and Singapore, uh, Japan is also a civil law country. Uh, and uh, having catching up with European standards and finally obtained an adequacy decision. Uh, recently. And followed by the Philippines uh, hybrid legal system of civil law and common law, and finally uh, goes to uh, the common law jurisdiction of Singapore. 
So uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, request uh, all speakers to observe the presentation time uh, 20 minutes per person to ensure sufficient time for panel discussion. And also, uh, as stated by Kay earlier, uh, all audience are expected to uh, write down uh, the questions in the chat box. Please use chat box only for this purpose. Uh, thank you in advance for your cooperation. So uh, let me briefly introduce uh, the first uh, speaker uh, from Germany about the GDPR, Mr. Henning von Zantier. Uh, he's a partner, founding partner of von Zanti and uh, Dachowski uh, Law Office in uh, Germany and Poland. And in Asia, he's serving as the chair of Asian European Subcommittee for many years and working with Asian uh, clients uh, closely. So uh, with much experience and expertise in this area and serving as data protection officers for many uh, enterprises. So, uh, uh, Mr. Henning von Zantier, uh, please start your uh, presentation. Thank you very much for the invitation. This is very kind. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, it's a big honor to be the only European speaker here in this very distinguished uh, panel, virtual panel. Um, Yes, I'm, I'm happy to show you our slides, uh, but I would like to say in the beginning, a comparative perspective is difficult uh, from the German perspective because the GDPR is 100% valid in Germany. We have some additional uh, um, provisions from the national side, but generally uh, we have adopted the GDPR uh, this is uh, the reason why I'm here, the first speaker to more or less introduce the GDPR to you. Thank you again for uh, inviting me and thank you for the audience to, to be with us. And now I'm happy to show you our slides. I hope everybody can see our slides. So, uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Matuyasu Rose, for the introduction. So, I don't have to say much about ourselves. Uh, just as you pointed already out, uh, I'm also a data protection officer, so I can also help Asian companies who come to Europe and um, would like to be consulted or who look for a data protection officer within the European or GDPR context. So what are the table of contents? Why GDPR? Some general remarks, uh, then comparison GDPR and German law, the most important direct regulations, including the TOMs and liability, and then the importance uh, for third country companies. Uh, this is uh, especially Asian companies. Uh, this I will have the last uh, two slides. So altogether, we have uh, 12 slides on contents here in my presentation. So why GDPR? This is a, is a lot of text. Uh, I try to summarize it. Uh, Europeans are known for uh, having more of a uh, bureaucracy than Americans, for example. So is this another idea of this? Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. It is the uh, attempt to accommodate the powers of companies or the state, which collect data and the individual on the other side uh, about whom are the data. So it is about the GDPR is about the protection of individuals. So that means data about a person belonging to this person. It is also meant in the beginning against the IT giants, especially from California. And it helped that we have several rights like the right to erase uh, information and so on. But the problem is uh, is this successful? First of all, it rather was an embarrassment for smaller companies. So 12% uh, 
uh, in, according to a study from Oxford University said they lost profits because of GDPR. It's quite a documentary intensive um, project to have implemented the GDPR. And it seems that the IT giants didn't lose anything, at least according to the study. And partly the IT giants refused to comply with the GDPR and it is difficult to go against them like Meta, uh, to which belongs Facebook, refuses to stop sending personal data to the US, even a third country without images in, in a third country from California US without uh, EU at a uh, commission ad adequacy decision, which was in former times the foundation for uh, Meta to uh, to collect data in California. But GDPR is also against the overwhelming state power, e.g. one party system where individual is more submitted to the state uh, power. So this is the idea uh, 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 of the GDPR. What is the use for companies since we have many uh, business lawyers here? It is not to protect data of companies, not to get me wrong here. Experts who are among us know it. It's a protection is aimed to protect individual. And it's a rather even a protection of individuals as consumers or employees against companies' power. But there is one advantage, I think, for companies. And you can also consider or perceive the GDPR like a certification process um, on the processing of data in order to manage uh, damages, e e uh, for example, leaks and accommodate uh, company power to control data and individual rights. So all what you do, according to the GDPR, can also help your company being safer and thus uh, also being more attractive for employees and clients uh, for, their, um, for your products. I think Europe is, is quite keen on data protection uh, and GDPR has been a lot uh, at least looked at, but I think sometimes we overdo it. Like in the emergencies, like a pandemic, as we all had uh, on the globe uh, for the last two years, uh, partly government decided rather to protect the data of citizens and thus measures to take against uh, viruses were not done because here to some extent uh, data protection was prevailing over uh, the health services. So actually the, the countries that perform best within let's say the OECD, the, the more rather the richer countries we're actually from East Asia. So it's Japan, it's South Korea, and it's Taiwan. Uh, they did have a higher level of data protection in the pandemic, but if it was needed, they said, no, we need to collect data quickly and uh, identify where are sources of the virus. And this was one of the major uh, uh, advantages that uh, these three East Asian democracies had over European countries. So for example, Japan had uh, only a fifth of killed people by pandemic in comparison to Germany per capita. So uh, there's also a limit of data protection. So this is a general introduction of that. Now uh, I make it very short, as I said, uh, for the rest. Um, because we all will, as I saw with the other presentation, go through uh, the regulation of GDPR, at least in the first session. And so I will make it short. I already said German law is more or less GDPR. We have some very few national German uh, laws which complement the GDPR. For example, there is a compulsion to have a data protection officer DPO if a company has 20 employees or more in Germany. This is one, but the, more or less all the rest is GDPR. This is our data protection law in Germany. So then I go through this, what my colleagues will also go through. And uh, here you can say it's the purest uh, uh, level of, of telling you that since I only tell what the GDPR says. 
So personal data is any information related to an identified or identifiable natural person. So no company rights uh, uh, data, for example. Uh, um, there are special categories of personal data, the so-called sensitive data, for example, racial or ethnic origin, political opinion, religious or philosophical beliefs, or so on. And it's important to know that the GDPR is quite open how you safeguard them. They say only those sensitive data have to be protected in a more specific way. How you do it, it's uh, up to the company to do it. But once it is scrutinized, at least here in Europe, in the EU, or in Germany, then uh, the, the state data protection officer will see whether you have done it well if, for example, a damage ha happened. So processing uh, then one, the GDPR is about processing of personal data, any operation relating to personal data, collecting, uh, proceeding, and all that. And then an uh, important um, uh, notion for the Asian participants here is third countries. So for, uh, for the GDPR, a third country is all countries that are not belong to the European economic area. So that includes not only the 27 EU countries, but also Norway, Liechtenstein, and uh, there's another one, uh, uh, Switzerland, I think. Okay, uh, so um, the principle of the GDPR is you're not allowed to proceed data without a legal basis, which is, seems to be a very sharp sort of uh, impediment to proceed, uh, uh, but then Article 6 of the GDPR list, the permissible legal basis. So the most important is the content of the subject. You can uh, proceed, uh, process any data if you have the consent of the person whose data you process. So this is the most common thing. And once you do not have the uh, consent, you can ask for that. But processing is also, uh, it's also permissible, uh, it's uh, processing if it's necessary for the performance of a contract to which the data subject is party. And then processing is, uh, if the processing is necessary for compliance with a legal obligation to which the controller of the data is subject. So if uh, there's a court order or whatever other obligation, uh, this is also uh, permissible. These are the three main uh, bases, legal bases for uh, the processing of data. Then come for three uh, exceptions. Uh, processing is, is if processing is necessary in order to protect the vital interest of the data subject of another natural person. Here, for example, the pandemic is a reason that was allowed. So the data protection uh, GDPR never impeded our governments to do the right thing within pandemic, but unfortunately was not always done. Then this is the processing. If the processing is necessary for the performance of a task carried out in the public interest, for example, if a police then collects data for uh, parking cars, uh, it can do so because this is in the public interest, even you do not have the uh, permission of the, or the consent of the par car owner. And finally, a quite difficult, uh, uh, legal basis is processing if processing is necessary for the purpose of the legitimate legitimate interest pursued to the, by the controller or third party, except where such interests are overridden by the interests of fundamental rights uh, of the data subject. So it's a pondering of, of uh, uh, data protection, and this is uh, always uh, difficult. But uh, these three, as I said, are rare exceptions. So the most important regulation, um, uh, data sub subjects must be informed about the process, processing, immediate information about the processing, the identity of the controller, the contract uh, contact to the data protection officer, if there is any, as well as the legal basis and purpose of processing is required. The information about the GDPR also must be presented on the website. As you know, 
more, almost all companies have a privacy policy um, uh, uh, text on their website. This is needed. Also, cookies are data uh, uh, data processing. Special banners are required to show what the, the data are collected. Also, own uh, employees must be informed about data processing in a company. Every company processes the data of its own employees, employees and so uh, the content is the consent is requested. So documentation and duties, you have also record of processing activities, list of all processes concerning uh, personal data are to be held by all um, companies and at least in Germany, uh, any state data protection officer can scrutinize whether this is done or not. Actually, as a matter of fact, there are so little funds uh, for the state data protection officers that they never will come to a small company and, and just see whether all data uh, um, uh, 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 lists are, are available. But mostly it's in, in the case of damages, then they will control and this if you then have not complied with it, uh, you have a problem because you can be held liable. So data protection concept, uh, a summary of all data protection measures of a company and information about the lawfulness of respective data processing operation have to be held. Constants of the data perception, uh, the data subject, sub subjects all received consent should be kept carefully so that you can show once you have control of a state data protection officer. Then also the data erasure policy. So all that you have a list of all data when they have to be erased of clients, uh, employees, and so on. Uh, the one, as I said, important principle is the principle uh, to, uh, to the obligation to erase. Personal data may only be stored and processed as long as they are necessary for the respective purpose. When the purpose no longer exists, they must be deleted. So even if the data subject does not ask for it, it has to be deleted, deleted or erased. The problem is that you have, as I suppose, as we have, at least as I suppose, you also have certain uh, co uh, retention obligation. In certain cases, the data must be kept even after the purpose has been fulfilled. For example, for tax reason, for accounting reason, uh, and for other reasons, or maybe a limited liability uh, 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 limitation. Uh, of um, of the claim, uh, then uh, you can keep the data. Rights of the data uh, data subjects. It's the right to information that, that the controller has the uh, um, the data. Right to access, so you can have access to the data. Right to rectification by contents if this has been. Uh, uh, if this is not open, right to erasure, I said so. Right also to object that at all data are collected, even if uh, a data subject has given consent, con consent, it can object that and then ask uh, for deletion. Uh, and but also it can object to the contents and right to data portability. That means once you change from one company to the other, be it Facebook or another. Company, you can ask this um, data controller that all your data are transferred to another company. And it's the data controller who has to take care that all data can be easily transferred to even a competitor. Uh, not every responsible person processes the data independently. Um, e.g. many commission external tax consultants to calculate the wages. So uh, uh, often a company will commission other to process the data for the data controller. This is called commission processing. In this case, a so-called data protect processing agreement must be concluded. And in all, um, the uh, other company then has to comply with 
the data protection obligation of the controller. Well, uh, to make it short, because I'm close to the time limit, um, there has to be uh, the uh, TOMS, which will then uh, provide that data protection is provided. These are technical and organizational measures. This is uh, abbreviation is TOM. So main areas of TOMs are entry to control, physical access to data processing facilities. So you have to close the door for your server room, for example, and lock it, of course. Access control, no write or read access to third parties, and maybe for sensitive uh, uh, data also internally that only, for example, a medical doctor has access and not, uh, to the uh, data of a patient and not the, the assistant. <clears throat> if uh, she or he is not involved. Forwarding control, sufficient encryption of mails, for example, input control, logging system, record every access to personal data. This is more or less up to the very company to provide it, but TOMS has to be uh, implemented uh, and written down, and if the state data protection officer comes by, shown to him. Fines are high, as you know, uh, there was the idea the big companies like uh, GAFA, uh, this is uh, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Google, they don't uh, are not too impressed by 20 million euros fine. So it was also up to 4% of the turn annual turnover, and this will more impress them. So in Germany, we had, for example, one fine of uh, uh, 35 million to H&M, and Amazon got fined even for three quarters of a billion euro. So they are considerable fines. Um, well, then the last two slides go on the principle for uh, third years countries. Um, this is uh, concerns all activities for often and tests establishment of a data controller or processor in the union, including Switzerland, Liechtenstein, and Norway regardless of whether the processing takes place in the European Union or outside. Um, exceptions are application of the GDPR according to the marketplace, offering goods or services to data subjects in the European Union, irrespective of whether the payment is to be made by those data subjects. Uh, this must be included in the website. Monitoring of behavior of data subjects as far as their behavior takes place within the European Union and their concerns also consulates. It is also possible for third country companies to become processors, e.g. storage of data on servers outside the EU. Also then they are subject to uh, GDPR, but on a certain uh, exceptional uh, way, of course, no uh, EU data, uh, state data protection officer can Go to Facebook and look in California whether they have um, uh, safeguard all these measures that are needed to, according to the GDPR. Either there's an adequacy at the decision of the EU Commission, and so far only uh, Japan complied completely with the GDPR in accordance from these countries uh, uh, which are present today. Uh, sorry, yes, uh, others did but it is uh, uh, very importantly Japan. And then, or there's an agreement on appropriate safeguards, application to the EU standard protection clauses, Tom transparency obligation, documentation obligation liability, uh, or there are binding corporate rules, binding internally data protection policies within a group of undertakings, the enterprises of a multinational uh, concern, and it must be approved by the competent data protection authority in the EU. The agreement, if I may add, uh, was is between the two companies, actually the one being in Europe and the other in, for example, Asia. Well, this is a short ride through the GDPR from a German perspective. I hope you could follow that, and um, I'm very happy to answer questions. Thank you very much for your attention.
Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, your well organized and practical uh, presentation, uh, Mr. Henning von Zantier. <laughs> uh, being a Japanese lawyer, I have been consulted about uh, GDPR compliance by uh, many, many clients, Japanese uh, corporations, because it has a very uh, far reaching extraterritorial application of law, especially for companies, foreign companies doing business in European. Uh, community, whether physically or virtually. Uh, uh, virtually. And also, uh, Japan's legislation is heavily influenced by GDPR, um, moving toward the reinforced regulations to catch up with the uh, European standards, and finally obtained uh, the adequacy decision uh, recently. So, uh, followed by uh, the presentation about uh, GDPR uh, from Europe, in this context, we go to the next speaker uh, from Japan, Mr. Uh, Shohei Shibuya, uh, lawyer of Yokogi and Matsui Partners. Uh, he is a specialist in computer technology issue and international practice and uh, lots of experience in uh, this area. So uh, Mr. Shibuya, uh, please uh, commence uh, your uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Hirose Sensei. Hold on, please let me show my presentation. Hold on, please. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Shohei Shibuya, and I am a Japanese qualified lawyer and a member of Tokyo Bar Association. As introduced, I'm here today to talk about Japanese data protection law from a comparative perspective with GDPR. Hopefully this presentation will help you to understand a bit of Japanese data protection law. And in this presentation, I will compare Japanese data protection laws and GDPR from the point of what and who Oh, sorry, what and who and where, when and how. In the first point, the what point, uh, I will talk about general overview of Japanese data protection law and also talk about what kinds of information is protected under uh, and what right does data project, data subject have under Japanese data protection law and GDPR. And in the second point, I will talk about who does it mainly apply to or the main target of Japanese data protection law and the GDPR. And in the third point, I will talk about where the law and regulation are applicable to. And first point, I will talk about when is the consent of data subject or any other legal basis required under Japanese data protection law and GDPR. And finally, I will talk about how to obtain the consent from the data subject. Okay, the first topic is what is the act on the protection of personal information? Uh, the act on the protection of personal information, or I'll just call it APPI from here. And it was, it was enacted in 2003 and regionally cam came into force in 2005. So it's been more than 17 years since it came into force in Japan. And nearly 20 years since it was enacted. The APPI had been reformed in recent years. There were two major amendments. The first amendment is 2015 amendment, which is, came into effect in 2017. This amendment was made based on the recognition that the establish, establishment of the environment to utilize personal data while considering the privacy protection has become an urgent task in Japan, such as business activities have become global and a lot of data have been distributed beyond the borders. And this amendment includes establishment of the Personal Information Protection Commission Japan, which is an independent super supervisory authority, authority entrusted with the oversight and enforcement of the APPI. This amendment introduced a number of new safeguards and also strengthened existing safeguards, including establishment of the provisions 
relating to the applicability of the APPI to offshore entities. And also uh, provisions relating to anonymization of personal information and so on. And this amendment brings the Japanese data protection systems closer to GDPR. The second amendment is 2020 amendment, which is came into effect in April 1st, 2022. And it was just five months ago. And since GDPR was enacted in 2018, this amendment was impacted by GDPR and the adequacy decisions by the uh, EU committees. Uh, this amendment includes strengthening the rights of the data subject and strengthen the regulations relating to the cross-border transfer, and also introducing new provisions relating to pseudonymization of personal information and so on. Okay. Going forward to next one, what kind of information is protected under uh, APPI and GDPR? First of all, I would like to introduce the basic terms that are used in APPI. In APPI, terms are used slightly different from the terms in GDPR. For example, we use the word personal information, which corresponds to the terms personal data in GDPR. And the term personal data in APPI means the personal information constituting the personal information database. And this personal information database means the collection of information which has been systematically organized so that specific person, personal information can be searched using the computer. And which corresponds to the filing system in GDPR. So uh, APPI distinguishes the term personal information from personal data. And most, most of personal information may fall under the personal data but not always. For example, if a single data set is collected and processed manually, such as writing someone's name in post-it notes or sticky notes and leave it on the desk, it is a personal information, but it, it is not falls under the personal data. Well, this difference is very important because all the provisions in APPI concerning the obligation of the business operator applies to the personal data not the personal information. Okay, so the term personal information in APPI means the information relating to our living individual, which falls under the, any of the following items. This, the first one is those containing the name, date of birth, or other descriptions whereby a specific individual can be identified, including those which can be readily uh, collated with other information and thereby identified a specific individual. And this category is also includes information which by itself does not enable identification, but when readily collated with other information allows the identification of a specific individuals. And the next one is those containing an individual identification code. And the term personal data in GDPR means, as you see in the right side of the screen, the slide, as you see in this slide, both terms are about the information rel relating to a person and that can be identified an individual. And uh, so I would say it is very similar. And these are the kinds of information that are specifically listed as a personal information or a personal data in the act or regulation. Well, however, these kinds of information are just an example of the personal information or personal data. And the personal information or personal data includes other informations which relates to a person and that can be identified as an individual. So I believe that the most of the personal information defined in APPI would also falls under the personal data defined in GDPR. And there will be no substantial difference between the scope of this personal information defined in APPI and personal data defined in GDPR. Okay, uh, next slide. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and under APPI, uh, the topic is what right does data subject have? And under APPI, data subjects can request that a business operator disclose the purpose of the use of their personal data, how they can access, correct, or spend it. So this is right of disclosure, right of corrections, and right to utilization seeds and deletion of the retained personal data. So the right of data subject is strengthened by uh, the two, 2020 amendment of APPI. However, the right of the data subject under GDPR is still strong compared to that of uh, APPI. Okay, and who does it mainly apply to? Under APPI, we use the term business oper operator handling personal information, well, which means to all business operators that handles the personal information database in Japan. This refers to both companies that offer goods and service in Japan and are lo located within the countries and those within offices outside it. Therefore, similar, similar to the GDPR, APPI has an extraordinary, extra territorial reach, which I will explain later in slide. Okay, and next one, uh, where is it applicable to? And APPI applies in the cases where a business operator handles the personal information of a person in Japan in relation to supplying a good or a service to a person in Japan in foreign country. It is not limited to business operator who established in Japan or has an office in Japan. Uh, before, 2022, uh, before 2020 amendment, provisions of APPI apply extra, extra territory only when an overseas business operator has obtained the personal information over principal in Japan in relation to its provisions of goods or services provided to the principal in Japan. Well, I mean, this did not cover situations where the principal is different from the customer of the goods or services. Well, under the 2020 amendments, the APPI also apply extraterritorially to such cases as long as both of the corporate body customer and the principal are located in Japan. And next uh, issue is cross-border transfer or the maybe cross-border processing. Under APPI, transfer of personal information to an offshore third party is not permitted in principle, but the business operator is able to transfer it with the consent of the data subject, but certain information is required to be provided to the data subject prior to obtaining the consent. And there are exceptions for the countries establishing equivalent standard to the data in Japan. Well, I mean, these countries are only EU countries and Great Britain. These are the only countries that are exceptions. And there are also the exceptions for the third parties establishing a system conforming to certain standards. Under 2020 amendment of APPI, the regulation of cross-border transfer is strengthened and new regulation is uh, set forth. And that is uh, before conducting the cross-border transfer to a third party outside Japan, the data subjects must be informed uh, certain informations such as name of the countries where the data is to be transferred, the personal information protection system of the destination country or data protections measure to be taken by the data importer. Okay, the next one is, when is the consent of the data subject or any other legal basis required? Under GDPR, processing of personal data is lawful only under one of the legal basis specified in Article 6 of GDPR, as I explained in the earlier uh, presentation, uh, such as uh, data subject prior consent or a legal basis. Uh, in APPI, the consent of data project 
data subject is required when the business operator acquiring sensitive uh, personal information, changing utilize, utilization purpose of the personal data, providing personal data to a third party, and transferring personal data to an offshore third party. So under a APPI, the legal basis are not required for the collections or the use itself, except for the case listed in this uh, slide. And, and the next one is uh, how to obtain the consent of the data subject. Under GDPR, the consent of the data subjects must be an um, ambiguous, unambiguous or explicit indication of the data subject wishes. Under APPI, the consent could be in, uh, implicit or implied depending on the situations and the conditions. I mean, whether or not it must be an, uh, uh, sorry, uh, whether or not it must be an ambiguous, an ambiguous or explicit is not specifically required even for the collection of sensitive personal information. Okay. And okay, so these are the principles also. We're also a PPI, compar uh, comparative perspective with GDPR. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Shibuya. Uh, this is a very uh, understandable or uh, good comparison between Japanese law and the GDPR for uh, each aspect of the regulations. Uh, very interesting and easy to understand. So uh, in many aspects, uh, Japanese law is uh, very close to GDPR level. However, still, even now, uh, in some points, uh, like uh, the ambit of protection is broader in GDPR sometimes, and uh, uh, remedies available or are, are much more in, under GDPR. Uh, so or Japanese labor is becoming uh, closer to GDPR, but not to say the same. So or from my experience, uh, many Japanese companies uh, doing business in European countries uh, so much concerned about uh, how to transfer uh, personal data between uh, Europe and Japan, for example, retrieving employees' data or uh, customers' data from European uh, jurisdictions to Japan, so uh, offshore transfer. So uh, sometimes they misunderstand that after the adequacy decision uh, obtained from European authorities uh, by Japan, uh, things have been relaxed. So uh, we can easily transfer data from Europe to Japan. Uh, it's become much easier. But this is not the case. This is uh, a misunderstanding. Uh, the reason being that uh, Japanese level uh, minimum standards have been going up. So of course, uh, we must comply with this uh, very close to European standards. And even for the future, uh, things are, are likely to uh, move uh, toward uh, even uh, reinforce, more reinforced regulations in Japan, probably. So a uh, very interesting uh, comparison. So uh, the next speaker uh, go to the Philippines. Uh, Philippines have the hybrid structure of uh, civil law and common law. And from a different uh, perspective, uh, Ms. Maria Concepcion Simunda, uh, head of legal and uh, data privacy officer, ING Bank uh, will make uh, presentations. Uh, let me uh, introduce her briefly. Uh, she has been uh, working uh, closely with uh, European uh, uh, legal society, like European Chambers of Commerce, and co-chairing uh, Real Estate Committee and uh, Tax and Financial Services Committee, and also getting many, many recognitions and certifications like the Philippines top 100 lawyers. So, uh, Ms. Maria Concepcion Simundak, uh, please commence your uh, presentation about the Philippines. Okay. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I trust that you can all hear me. So, well, good afternoon from where I am in the world. So thank you very much, Hirose san for that very wonderful introduction. So this afternoon, I, I will be discussing the latest situation of the Philippines 
regarding data protection law. Particularly, I will be comparing the GDPR and the Philippine Data Privacy Act. Okay, so now we take a look at the Philippine Data Privacy Act or Republic Act 10173. So the, the Data Privacy Act or the DPA was uh, became law in 2012 and the implementing rules and regulations were issued in 2016. So this is the main law governing data protection in the Philippines. Under this law, the National Privacy Commission or the NPC was created. The NPC is tasked to issuing various circulars and issuances regarding the implementation of the Data Privacy Act and the IRR. So the DPA is IRR and the various issuances of the NPC make up the body of regulation of data protection in the Philippines. It's interesting to note that uh, the DPA was actually patterned after the European Data Protection Directive, which is the predecessor of the GDPR. So there are a lot of similarities between Philippine law and European law with respect to data protection. In fact, um, our NPC often cites um, the GDPR or the EU Data Protection Directive, it, its opinions or advisories with respect to the, DP, to the DPA, while these are not binding under Philippine law, these can have persuasive effect on regulators and on the courts. Okay, so for, for this slide and for the next few slides, I will be comparing the provisions of the Philippine DPA and the EU GDPR. So first, with respect to the purpose, while both laws have the primordial purpose of protecting data, there is also emphasis on the free flow of information. So for the DPA, it's not meant to cur curtail exchange of information, but in Instead, it wants to create a balance so that there is data protection and at the same time, there is free flow of information. With respect to the coverage, so both EU GDPR and the Philippine Data Privacy Act have extraterritorial application. So this means that the processing of personal data of natural persons within the Philippines as well as the processing of data of Filipino citizens outside of the Philippines are within the coverage of the DPA. As to consent, um, I will be skipping this first because I will be discussing more on that later. Uh, under the Philippine Data Privacy Act, there's also a need to conduct a privacy impact statement for every processing system that involves personal data. As for other obligations aligned between the DPA and the GDPR, so under the DPA, there is a need to appoint a data protection officer. So this is registered with the NPC. It is also required that the NPC is updated in case of any change in the data protection officer of a PIC. There's also the mandatory breach notification within 72 hours. Of course, uh, PICs and PIPs are also required to implement technical, organizational, and physical security measures. There's also a requirement to maintain the ROPA or the records of processing activities. And lastly, there is a need to comply with data sharing requirements. Now, um, on to cross-border data transfers. So unlike uh, the EU GDPR, wherein there are certain conditions that have to be met in order for cross-border cross data transfer to occur, under the DPA, there is no such restrictions. However, the geographic location of the processing must be clearly set out in the subcontracting or data sharing agreement. And it's also important to note that the PIC will always remain responsible for the data that was transferred. So whether it be through outsourcing, data sharing, 
or subcontracting, the, the PIC has to make sure that the, the data is protected. So what about non-compliance? What are the consequences? The NPC can issue a compliance order, order, can issue a cease and desist order, can require companies to pay damages. They can also ban processing and they can initiate criminal prosecution. Okay. So under the DPA, we also have the data subject, the PIC and the PIP. So again, for emphasis, what's important to note here is that the PIP, sorry, the PIC has the responsibility of making sure that the data processing conforms with the DPA and its IRR. So it has to put that in the respective contract with its PIPs. Now we move on to the definition of personal information. So under Philippine law, personal information, which is covered by the DPA, refers to any information, whether it be recorded or in a material form or not, from which the identity of an individual is apparent or can be reasonably and directly asserted. So this can cover any information that when put together with other information would directly and certainly identify an individual. So in my professional career, I've always been asked because sometimes there are data points that seemingly would not constitute personal data. But then if you connect that with other data points, then you are able to identify a certain individual, then that becomes personal information. So it's within the coverage of the DPA. Now we move on to sensitive personal information. Uh, sensitive personal information is the counterpart of the special categories of data under the GDPR. So um, under the DPA, these cover your um, race, ethnic origin, marital status, even age. Um, it also covers your health, education, um, genetic or sexual life, or any proceeding or any offense committed or alleged to be committed by that individual. It also covers um, government issued IDs or licenses, or for example, tax returns. And finally, this covers um, any information that are classified pursuant to a particular law or regulation. So the Philippine DPA, also introduces a third category of personal information, which is privileged information. So privileged information, this is also within the ambit of the Data Privacy Act. So your privileged, privileged information, um, these are generally um, correspondences or communications between parties wherein there is an element of trust and confidence. Like for example, your husband and wife communication attorney and client communication. So these are the privileged information and are accorded the same protection, just like your sensitive personal information. So when can we process personal information? Under Philippine law, generally it is permitted, provided that at least one of the following conditions exist. So I just want to make a special note here regarding legitimate interest. So under Philippine law, before invoking legitimate interest as the lawful basis for processing of, a, of personal data, the PIC needs to make sure that it complies with the three tests. So the first one is the purpose test. What is the purpose for the processing? Second is the necessity test. Is the, per is the processing necessary in order to achieve that purpose? And finally, the balancing test. Whether the rights of the data subject override the rights of the PIC. So if the PIC is not able to meet all of these tests, then it should not invoke legitimate interest. 
So um, this is just a snapshot of the lawful basis for processing personal information. As you can see, um, it's practically identical. Now, um, as to processing of sensitive personal information and privileged information, as a general rule, it is prohibited, except in any of the following cases. So just a snapshot again, um, they, the, the lawful basis for processing SPI under Philippine law and GDPR are more or less the same, except that uh, you will note that under the DPA, there is no explicit allowance for processing of public data. Okay, so again, personal information generally allowed, sensitive per personal information generally prohibited unless certain conditions are met. Now we go on to consent. So under Philippine law, in order for there to be a valid consent, it must be freely given, it must be specific, and uninformed indication of will. So this should be evidenced either by a signature, an opt-in, or you know, by clicking an icon, by sending a confirmation, email, or through verbal communication. Opt-in, silence, pre-tick boxes, inactivity, implied consent, these are not allowed under Philippine law. So is consent always needed when processing personal or sensitive personal information? I always get asked this question. As we all know, no. The answer is no. Consent is just one of the criteria for lawful processing of both personal and sensitive personal information. And we have to consider as well whether consent is the most appropriate basis for personal data processing. Um, our NPC actually stated that uh, there's already this phenomenon called consent fatigue, wherein your data subjects are just bombarded with requests for consent. And most often than not, these requests for consents are very broad. So therefore, the, the consent becomes superficial. So uh, our NPC espouses that PICs should consider the most lawful basis that is really in line with their relationship with the individual and the purpose of the processing. So um, what are the three uh, data privacy principles under Philippine law? So we have transparency, I think that's self-explanatory, legitimate purpose, and of course, proportion proportionality. So you should only be processing data that is in line or not too excessive in relation to your declared or specified purpose. Okay, so um, I can skip this considering that I only have a few minutes left. Okay, so what are the data privacy rights under Philippine law? So you have the right to be informed. So usually that's, that's in the form of your data privacy notice. So your data privacy notice should state what is being processed, why is the processing being made, how is the processing being conducted, and finally, who is conducting the process? Who is conducting the processing? Uh, Philippine law also allows for right to access. Um, we also have the right to object, erasure, and, uh, and rectification. Note, however, that uh, the right to object and erasure or blocking are not absolute. So under Philippine law, um, PICs also have the right to retain personal data if it's necessary for fulfillment of, um, of the, the purpose for which it was collected. In defense or in exercise of a legal claim, legitimate business purpose, and finally, if the processing is provided for or, or the retention is allowed by law. So as to the right to damages and the right to file a complaint, so um, aggrieved data subjects can file a complaint with the NPC if they feel that the DPO um, or the, the PIC was not able to redress their concerns. 
a limitation on data privacy rights. So the, the rights of the data subject will not apply in case of scientific and statistical research, right? Uh, and they also will not apply in case of investigations in relation to criminal administrative or tax liabilities. Now, um, the, the data in front of you, these are excluded from the coverage of the Data Privacy Act. So these cover um, information relating to government functions, information processed for journalistic, artistic, literary, or research purposes, and those information covered by bank secrecy law or anti-money anti laundering regulations. Okay. Um, so if, if your company is doing business in the Philippines, please note that of, uh, take note of these five pillars of compliance. So first, there's a need to appoint a DPO. Second, it's a must to conduct a privacy impact statement assessment on all of your processing. Third, there needs to be some privacy management program. And you have to implement that through your data privacy and security measures. And finally, if there is a breach, then it has to be reported to the NPC if it will complete reach or breach the mandatory notification requirements. Other requirements, uh, there's also a need to register the data processing systems being conducted or, or used by APIC. Um, there's also a requirement to file an annual report of all security incidents and personal data breaches. So whether they were subject to a mandatory notification or not, you have to include that in your annual security incident report. So when, uh, as for the mandatory notification, when is notification required? Uh, notification is required to the NPC if the following conditions are present. So first, uh, if the personal data involves sensitive personal information or any other information that may be used to identify identi to enable identity fraud. Second, if there is reason to believe that the information may have been acquired by an unauthorized person. And finally, if there is serious harm to any affected data subject. So if all of these conditions are present, the DPO of the PIC should notify the NPC within 72 hours upon knowledge of there or a reasonable belief that a breach has occurred. So before I, I end my presentation, just to give you, you know, the latest developments and issues in, in the Philippines. So first, the NPC recently issued the guidelines or circular on administrative fines for data privacy infractions. So depending on whether the violation is grave or major, the MP NPC will impose administrative fines ranging from 0.5% to 3% and 0.25% to 2% respectively of the annual gross income of the PIC or PIP. Um, recently also there was a rise in smishing incidents. So smishing means, you know, there's uh, unsolicited text messages from anonymous numbers. Some even containing receiver's name, asking the, the receiver to click on certain link. So the, S, the NPC is proactively investigating this matter to identify the causes, implement possible solutions to mitigate, if not eliminate this threat brought about by targeted smishing. As a response, telecommunication companies have blocked um, identified mobile numbers, and they've also uh, started blocking malicious URL links. Uh, the NPC also ordered the immediate takedown or issued a cease and desist order from the processing from the processing by several lend online lending companies because these online lending companies have um, harvested excessive information without legitimate purpose. For example, um, they requested for you know, contact list, photo gallery of, of the borrowers ostensibly to evaluate their credit worthiness. 
So that's it for my presentation. And I hope that you will you were able to learn a lot about data protection in the Philippines. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Maria Concepcion Himmelendak. Uh, uh, again, a very understandable uh, comparison between GDPR and the local laws of the Philippines, and with lots of uh, tables and drawings. And uh, when hearing about uh, Philippines law from you, I frankly had an impression that Philippines laws have de de developed much closer uh, to GDPR, even compared to uh, Japanese law. But one uh, big exception, uh, the difference is the transfer of personal data to third countries uh, is not restricted. So uh, probably this is uh, one point, uh, uh, one reason why uh, uh, the European countries uh, do not give adequate decision to uh, the Philippines at this moment, maybe. So uh, another characteristic of the Philippines laws would be uh, the strong requirement for organizational mechanism for the company to uh, comply, ensure compliance with data protection laws. This way of thinking uh, would come from, uh, at least partially, a common law or approach, in my impression, yeah. So uh, at the level of uh, statutory rules and uh, enforcement practices also, uh, we look forward to discussing this issue uh, by comparing uh, with other jurisdictions in the panel discussion session. Thank you very much. So uh, now uh, we go to uh, the first uh, final speaker uh, from Singapore, Ms. Uh, Ingrid Wang. Uh, partner of JWS Asia Law Corporation, uh, specialized in IT and media sectors and technology transactions, intellectual property, uh, regulatory matters. So she has lots of uh, experience and strong expertise in this area, uh, digital business and data compliance. So uh, Ms. Ingrid Wang, uh, please uh, commence your presentation about the Singapore law. Thank you. Um, let me share my screen. All right, this is up. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ying. Oh, um, I am from JWS Asia, which is a JV partner of the Singapore Office of Simmons and Simmons. Um, I am a Singapore qualified lawyer. And thank you for hanging in there with us. I promise my presentation would be hopefully short and sweet. Um, I, am, I am only picking up five differences between PDPA, which is the Singapore law, and GDPA and uh, GDPR, sorry, and PIPL. So if I may start. Okay, so um, maybe I'll give a background uh, on, on the Singapore side of things. Um, there is a balance between being business friendly and um, enforcing the rule of law. So in Singapore, I think there is a recognition that processing data itself is, is, is a technology that is a business that actually Singapore would like to bring into. And um, this is also coupled with the fact that Singapore has aspirations to be the data center hub of APEC. So I think with these business considerations in mind, um, the law, when, when we were looking at um, amending the PDPA, there were tons of roundtables that were actually set up by the PDPC, which is the commission, to engage the different sectors of the community in order to come up with this act. Um, and I would also like to point out that because of this, I think there are certain carves out, which carve outs which are, to me, pretty unique to Singapore. Um, some of them are, some of them are not. But the first one would be um, that the PDPA does not apply to individual acting in a personal or domestic capacity. I think that's quite common. Um, it does not apply to employee acting in a course of employment because it's meant to target organizations. Um, the third thing, which is quite um, unique to some places as compared to GDPR, for example, it does not apply to public agencies. Um, and the fourth, it does not apply to business contact information. And um, this is always a, a point that I 
I would always remind my clients, especially when they're collecting information, um, B2B clients, right? And they will say, oh, you know, actually all our clients are, are, uh, are business, they're not consumers. So the PDPA does not apply to us. But I always remind them that if their clients, are, particularly if they are small, medium enterprises, there is a very fine line between what is personal information and what is business information. Um, and that's always a, a good thing to keep at the back of our minds for this in Singapore. Okay, so the first um, difference that I would like to pick up would be um, the, the the usage of terms, right? Um, so in, in GDPR, there is data controller, um, which is the same in Singapore, but there's the data processor, which in Singapore is known as data intermediary. Um, in Singapore, a data intermediary would have much le lesser obligations. There are only three that they need to abide by. One is the protection obligation and the retention limitation obligation. And the third would be the data breach notification obligation. So this compared to a data controller, which has 11 obligations, is, is, is really a huge step down. So I would, um, so the distinction would, should be made quite clearly at the outset. Um, and this helps me to segue into the GDPR concern of joint control. Uh, I mean, I'm, I am obviously not EU qualified. So this is what I've learned from my colleagues in EU. Um, and I think it's quite relevant in Singapore as well. So how, uh, for example, the European Court of Justice has ruled three times against Facebook and other companies that any business using a platform or even just a widget should be considered joint controllers and that and therefore they should share the risk in terms of handling of the data. And, and this particular issue actually has not been brought up in Singapore yet, but I am very keen to see how the Singapore courts will look at this if it ever comes out. Um, and then I'd like to go to PIPL. Um, I've been told by my colleagues in China that um, even though they don't use the word data processes, they use the word entrusted parties. Um, and, and so there is also the similar concept in China. Okay. Um, the second difference I would like to point out would be the extraterritorial nature of the different acts. So all three acts, based on my understanding, have extraterritorial nature. Um, I guess in Singapore, it is slightly nuanced um, because if the, the key is whether the organizations are collecting, using, or disclosing personal data in Singapore. Um, and and it's and, and actually the qualification is, is that it does not matter whether it has a physical presence or whether it's registered as a company uh, in Singapore or anywhere else. So my take is that um, I'm, I take quite a conservative view about this. For example, if one of my clients has registered a company in Singapore, right? But actually none of the data flows to Singapore um, because you know, they collect non-Singaporean data, they process it using teams that are not based in Singapore. Um, the data does not flow to service in Singapore. My view nonetheless is still that because it is incorporated in Singapore, there is a sufficiently strong nexus to Singapore the PDPC may want to regulate it. So I, I generally take a conservative stance on this. Um, another example, for example, if, if a non-Singapore company has employees based in Singapore that access and use the data, um, I would think that the PDPA would, would still apply as well, right? Unless, unless these are considered data in transit. Right? So, um, I think in Singapore, the extraterritorial nature is slightly different. It's not, they are not so concerned um, about whether it is Singaporean data that you're using, for example, right? Which, which I think was, was, is the key for GDPR and PIPL. And I think this goes back to the fact that in Singapore, um, we really want to, to attract data processes to set up shop in Singapore. So I think that's, that's to me, I think that's, that's why it's drafted this way. Okay. Um, and the third thing is the right to be forgotten. In Singapore, there is no such express right. This is very different from um, the GDPR and the PIPL.
Right, and the fourth would be data protection by design principles. Um, my understanding is that in GDPR, there is the, the must for integration. Of course, I think at the national level, um, there are exceptions. For example, in France, um, a lawyer does not need to uh, integrate data protection principles when they're processing their client's data. Um, in under the PIPL, my understanding is that there is there, even though there's no express requirement, there is an implied obligation. Um, and for example, there are specific rules that that on the scope of data are allowed to be collected by different types of mobile apps, and there are various enforcement actions in this aspect. So my Chinese colleague has 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 advised me that under PIPL, they are of the belief that there is an obligation to, to, to have data protection by design, right? Um, under the PDPA, um, it is highly encouraged, uh, even though it is not an express requirement. Um, so in, in some of um, the guidelines that have been issued by PDPC, for example, um, they will talk about um, choosing cloud service providers that adheres to ISO, IEC standards for information security management. Um, so it is more of a soft approach rather than a express requirement. But um, our position has always been that in the event of an enforcement by PDPC, this having, having um, data protection by design principles, it's, it is important for mitigation purposes, right? So we can't say that, oh, we don't have anything so too bad, right? But if you have something in, you have a proper system, you implement it properly, this, this is always very, very good. And it goes a long way with PDPC in mitigating losses um, to start with, right? Okay, then the last one, um, it's the penalties. So um, my understanding is that there are both um, civil and criminal liabilities for breach in all three countries. I guess the concern is how severe, how severe it is. So under the PDPA, uh, before October 2022, um, the highest amount I think in Singapore that, that any organization can be fined is 1 million Singapore dollars. And it's not very high <laughs> compared to GDPR and PIPL. Um, in fact, in Singapore, the highest fine that has been levied so far is 750,000 Sing dollars. Um, but come 1st October 2022, uh, for breaches of the PPA, organizations may be fined for 10% um, uh, for, for, for organization where their annual turnover in Singapore exceeds 10 million, it will be 10% of their annual turnover in Singapore. For all other cases, the maximum would be 1 million. Same. So um, this is, I think, slightly different from GDPR, where it is, where I understand it's 2% of organizations worldwide at annual revenue. Um, or Okay, there are a few variations, right? But but at least in Singapore, it will be 10%. If your if your if your annual turnover in Singapore exceeds 10 mil, then it would be 10% of your annual turnover in Singapore. It's not a worldwide thing. Um there are other offenses um, where individuals may also be fined. Um, so when they're criminal in nature and, and it comes, the fine is between 5,000 to 10,000, but it potentially can come with imprisonment, right? Um, and then for representative or class actions, theoretically, it is possible in Singapore, but um, to start with, even in non-data cases, representative actions are very rare in Singapore. So I think the risk of that happening in Singapore is generally quite low. Um, recently, we have an interesting high court case um, where, where um, a plaintiff sued a defendant for using his personal data. Um, it went to high court and the high court basically said that the damage, um, the loss and damage suffered by a data subject has to be narrowly construed and shall not include emotional harm or loss of control over personal data, 
right? So this means that in, in, in civil actions, um, they still have to pass the usual threshold of, of, of what we use to, to assess loss and damages. And I think that that, that would make any success, that would make any claim um, quite difficult from a civil perspective. Yeah, so this has been appealed to the High uh, Court of Appeal. Uh, we will see what the Court of Appeal says. Um, yeah, and I think, let me see on the China side, would I have anything else to add? I think in China, um, um, let's see. Okay, so it sets up personal liabilities for persons in charge, and it can lead to criminal liabilities in civil cases. So severe cases, quite similar, but um, I think in, in 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 all three countries, uh, the, the the liabilities for organizations and their offices, they have been brought up to, uh, not all three countries. Sorry, under all three regimes, um, I think there is a there is the there is the the intention. I think to hold organizations to task, right, for any breach of of the respective laws. Okay, that's it for my presentation. It's short and sweet, as I promised, I hope. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Wing Yi Wang. Uh, this is, again, a very uh, interesting uh, comparison of three very different uh, jurisdictions at the same time. So now I understand that uh, the fundamental problem here underlying issue is uh, the ultimate objective of data privacy laws. Uh, first of all, as uh, stated in the, her uh, first speaker session about Germany, uh, GDPR focuses on the protection of individual, individual interests. Uh, so historically, Europeans have, been, uh, have, have a very sen a keen sense of privacy. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in Singapore, oh, it's much more business oriented and uh, press focus on the uh, interests of uh, business operator. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the level of penalty is going up significantly these days. This is uh, one thing which is not, not worth the issue. So, okay. Now uh, we have uh, finished uh, four uh, presentations. Uh, all of them are very interesting and uh, comparative. So uh, now we start the panel discussion session. So uh, initially, uh, we are expected to receive uh, your question from the audience by using the chat box. But as Kay announced uh, about 10 or 20 minutes ago, uh, this function uh, does not seem to be working well. So uh, the audience uh, expected to uh, raise hands and uh, uh, ask questions verbally. And uh, let's discuss among uh, all participants. Hands raised. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Okada is raising hands. So now uh, we welcome your question. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for, for, for the speakers for the very good uh, informative presentation. That this is very informative and helpful. Uh, one question I might have is about the trends of the enforcement of the data protection authority in each jurisdiction. So uh, I am from Tokyo. So um, for Japan, uh, practically the information enforcement action of the data protection authority is actually not the most serious concern for the um, companies because although the data Japanese authority is relatively active, but the the user do not uh, impose severe sanctions for violators. They basically um, publicize the non-compliance non of the companies so that the general consumers know which company is not compliant with the API. And I am wondering if the situation is the same in other countries, like uh, although the law itself 
set out the severe sanctions, are they actually enforced very frequently or um, seriously, or is it just a law that's setting out the um, sanctions, but um, the realistic harm to the companies are more on the reputational harm for non-compliance. So if you, you could elaborate on that point, that would be very appreciated. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your question. This is a um, very important uh, matrix uh, because uh, uh, the statutory uh, text of law itself and enforcement practices, these two things uh, must be distinguished and uh, uh, analyzed at the same time from different two, uh, two different perspectives. So the starting from uh, GDPR uh, jurisdictions uh, like Germany, uh, we imagine, everybody imagines that enforcement practices uh, are also uh, very strict. And that's why many uh, foreign companies doing business in uh, European jurisdictions are worried about it. So uh, now, uh, for example, in the Philippines and Singapore, uh, how and to what extent uh, this uh, law is enforced uh, practically? And uh, if you have any uh, published example of cases where uh, public uh, no, uh, business corporation was involved in the scandal and sanctioned severely uh, under the applicable rules. So uh, if you hit upon any recent uh, noteworthy cases, uh, especially the ones uh, foreign companies uh, have been involved, uh, how about uh, uh, for example, uh, Singapore or Ms. Ingvi Wang. Hi, so in Singapore, because um, the amount is really quite, I mean, the financial penalties that can, that, are, that, can, that can be levied are actually quite low. And I've mentioned that the 750,000 fine was the highest and it's very far away from the next highest claim. And that was really serious because there was health data of it was a third party processor of health data um, of many, many, many Singaporeans. So that, and, and it was very, it could have been prevented very easily and they did not. So that was a huge lapse. But otherwise in Singapore, we actually have not seen the PDPC. I mean, they are very active, but they have been very, um, they're robust in looking at cases, but they have not been very heavy handed in, in giving fines. But we think that um, it could also be a situation where they are of the view that it's to help organizations get used to this um, so that it does not disrupt their business uh, continuity. Although having said that with 1st of October, 2022, with the increase in the fines, I think that's when they will start looking into this very seriously. Um, and I've also mentioned that um, the civil action on the civil action side, I really do not think that there will be much, um, there will be very severe uh, losses in that case. So I think the, the, in Singapore, I think it's still one reputation and two, any financial penalties by PDPC. That's uh, my view for Singapore. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, so now I understand that uh, at least at this moment, uh, the financial and monetary sanctions against violators is not so severe in Singapore as a matter of practice. So it may not have uh, enough deterrent effect. May, but uh, from October this year, things might change. So uh, in a manner un uh, unpredictable. Yeah. Uh, how about uh, penal sanctions? So are you aware of any individual uh, was sent to jail sentences? No. Not yet. Not yet. Ah. I be hardly used, honestly. <laughs> ah, okay. Thank you. So uh, how about uh, the Philippines, Ms. Maria Concepcion Shimundak? Yeah. This well, is example of enforcement. Yeah. Well, for the Philippines, um, in the recent years, the NPC has mostly been just issuing compliance orders or ceased and deceased orders to companies. So there, there was no imposition of fines yet. In fact, the guidelines or, or the circular on the imposition of administrative fines was only issued this year. So it will only be applied prospectively this year. So no criminal prosecutions as well. So we expect that 
um, there will be you know, a stronger hand from the NPC on account of the imposition of the circular on administrative fines. Uh, thank you. So uh, maybe a similar situation uh, in Singapore. So uh, from European perspectives, maybe, uh, again, uh, th there is no sufficient deterrent power uh, to prevent uh, violation of data privacy at this moment, maybe. So uh, when working with uh, uh, European companies, for example, when giving advice to your clients, uh, local clients in uh, the Philippines, uh, uh, what are the practical, most problematic aspects of DDPR compliance? So on the face of it, uh, from the literal uh, interpretation of law, there are much similarity between these two laws, GDPRs and the local uh, laws of the Philippines. However, the enforcement the practice and the level may be uh, quite different. So facing these situations, uh, for example, when you encounter a local client uh, wishing to do business uh, in European jurisdiction for the first time, uh, what is the uh, uh, most important advice for this company? You're asking me? Yes. yes. Ah. Well, uh, yes, thank you for the question. Um, well, I think, as I said in the beginning, there is not enough funds for the state DPO, the data protection officers, to safeguard and scrutinize whether the companies uh, comply with the GDPR. They, they could do this, but they don't do this uh, because uh, in general, they are busy enough with damages that already that have occurred. And so to my knowledge, they only imposed fines when actually damages happened and they don't preventively uh, scrutinize the compliance with the GDPR. So I think this uh, seems to me uh, similar to, to uh, the other countries. Once this happens, once a, a breach uh, of the GDPR happens, then yes, high fines can be imposed. Criminal actions also be, are confined to fines and not jail. So the, the uh, European com uh, uh, parliament uh, has not the power to impose jail unless it's an uh, infringement of other national law or other criminal national law then of course jail can also be uh, jail sentences can also be imposed uh, but this is not uh, uh, subject to the gdpr well i mean what do i uh, advise uh, companies who invest here or are dealing with uh, european you need to advise and comply with the gdpr uh, this is very simple um, and fines will consider that it takes some time to comply um, but uh, so that would be to the advantage, but once there's a breach, uh, yes, uh, fines will be imposed. So I suppose it's like any law, uh, well, then uh, there's a breach, then consequences will uh, be drawn. And um, well, I suppose there are countries which are more relaxed on that within the EU and there are countries which are stricter on that. Uh, but there, I do not have an overview of all European countries, so this is difficult to assess. Uh, but yes, well, I, we are assuming that the that the law will function. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much yeah, for your practical comments. Uh, from my experience, again, uh, when working with Japanese companies uh, doing business in Europe, they are too much worried about uh, uh, the violation of GDPR. Maybe. Uh, due to the very you know, uh, well-known and notoriously uh, uh, far-reaching uh, extraterritorial applications, uh, partially. So they uh, think that they go to a big law firm and uh, they must make uh, uh, long, long compliance rules to enforce uh, in the company. Uh, however, uh, what is the minimum uh, standard? Uh, what they should observe uh, at minimum? Uh, to comply with GDPR. Uh, this is uh, our, our target of practical advice giving to uh, uh, Japanese local companies. Uh, thank you very much for your suggestion. So uh, now uh, it's time, uh, 7.50 p.m. Uh, in Japan. 
So uh, the first session uh, of this seminar uh, is uh, all over. So uh, now uh, I want to uh, give my speech to uh, uh, Mr. Hake Miyoshi. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Motiasu. Uh, we have well understood the comparison with GDPR and characteristic issues regarding each restriction in contrast to GDPR. Uh, in addition, we are sorry for some system trouble about chat function. So also in session two, uh, please kindly raise hand uh, when you have any question. So uh, we'll now have a short break. Please make sure that you are back by uh, 22 Tokyo time so that uh, we can continue this program. Now we would like to begin session two. Data protection laws of India, Indonesia, Japan, and China from a comparative perspective with Chinese data protection laws. Let me introduce our moderator and speakers for this session two. Session two's moderator is uh, Dr. Gordon Hughes, uh, Secretary General of Law Asia from Australia. Also, we have four speakers. Mr. Hernie Chen, senior partner of Dentos Shanghai from China. Mr. Keita Mori, partner of Uryu Itoga from Japan. Uh, Mr. Uh, Johannes C. Sashte P. Engel, founding partner of ActoSet from Indonesia. Uh, Ms. Brinda Bandari, independent lawyer from India. Dr. Gordon, so I would like to hand over mic to you. So please start. Thank you very much. And uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, yes, my, uh, my name is Gordon Hughes. Uh, I'm sitting here in Melbourne, Australia, uh, and I'll be your moderator for this session too. Uh, by way of background, I'm a legal practitioner, but I'm also in my spare time Secretary General of Law Asia. Uh, in my daily practice, I practice in the area of privacy and data protection, so I've got a particular personal interest in this session. And I must say, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, session one. Uh, I thought it was an excellent presentation uh, dealing with uh, the comparison of laws of various countries with the GDPR. The focus of this session is um, different. Instead of comparing the laws of various countries with the GDPR, we're comparing them with the emerging data protection regulation regime in China. Uh, and as you've been told, uh, the speakers for this session come from China, Japan, Indonesia, and India, and they're going to speak in that order. Uh, I've got to say, if you've had a chance to read the uh, bios on the website, you'll agree with me. These are four outstanding speakers, and it's hard to imagine a better panel than the one that we have, we have got. So... Uh, I just remind you one more time that the chat function is not working, so please remember to raise your hand if you have a question. The speakers are going to speak for 20 minutes each, uh, and then whatever time is left after that, if there are any questions, we'll have a panel discussion about them. Um, against that background, uh, we'll move to our first speaker, who's Mr Henry Chen. Uh, Mr Chen is Senior Partner at Denton's Shanghai, a very prestigious firm. Um, and previously he was AP Compliance Director of Ford. He's a specialist and leading expert in the area of corporate compliance, and so he's very well qualified to speak on this subject. Over to you, Mr. Chen. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, um, I'm talking about uh, uh, personal information protection law, right? In China, we call it uh, personal information, not personal data. Um, however, when we talk about uh, law in relation to personal information, we not only talk about um, personal information protection law, right? As you may see, uh, as number two here, uh, there are some other laws like cybersecurity law, data security law would be also available, would be also relevant. So let's talk about uh, um, Cyber security law, right? Um, what, what's the law about, right? Um, uh, there, there are a lot of things. 
which is most important is uh, classified protection system. Um, as you may know, um, when we talk about personal information, um, PI, we talk about compliance, which means um, we have to be mindful our obligations of protecting the uh, interest rights of uh, subject uh, matters, subject persons of those kind of uh, personal information, which means, you know, as a handler of PI, you are processing PI, uh, you have to be um, mindful of uh, observing the obligations of protecting the interest rights of those kind of subject persons, right? Um, so in terms of protection, you have a lot of things to do, right? You, you're not supposed to abuse, you know, the interest rights of the uh, subject persons. You, 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 for example, you don't buy and sell the personal information. You know, that's one of the obligations we're talking about in the session one, right? And also there's another obligations under cybersecurity law, which means you have to make your data system, you have to make your information system sound and right, good enough, you know, to protect, you know, those kind of a PI as, as a property from in those hackers, right? Um, so um, that system, or that's a system is called a classified protection system. So your system would be classified by five levels from the lowest level, level one to highest level, level five, right? The higher the level your system is, more obligations you will have to observe to protect the, uh, you know, the, the PI, right? Just like, uh, you know, PI, you can view the PI, personal information as property, as jewels, as gold, as silvers, right? Those uh, are valuable assets. And to protect the value assets, you know, like a gold, silvers, you will have to buy a safe, which should be strong enough to protect the properties from being stolen, from being robbed by those kind of, uh, uh, you know, robbers, thieves, same thing. You know, you have to make your online system strong enough to protect those kind of information those kind of personal information from being stolen, right? From being robbed. So that's, there are a lot of things about subsequent law. However, you know, the most important things is about classified protection system, right? This kind of very um, uh, important obligations for um, every enterprise, every unit, every companies in China to observe. So, Um, there, there, there you go, obligations classify protection. Article 21 of uh, subsequent law provides for the obligations for classified protection, right? So you have to, um, to adopt the system of classified protection, China uh, not only provides for a clause in the subsequent law, but also China issued a lot of uh, uh, standards, uh, guidelines for you know, each unit to follow. Then each unit can build up a strong um, system to protect um, those kind of uh, um, virtual assets from being stolen. Um, certainly, um, after finishing the uh, uh, law number one, subsequent law, we have to talk about 
personal information protection law, right? PI protection law. Um, those PI protection law more or less similar to GDPR. Uh, our legislators follow GDPR like a kind of a Bible. Um, so uh, our PIPL uh, is more or less similar to uh, GDPR. Uh, since in session one, our, our um, speakers talked about GDPR a lot, right? So I don't have to repeat what they said, uh, you know, um, for, for GDPR as, as well as for PIPO. So, um, um, however, there, yeah, as you may see here, right? Those kind of rights are similar to those in GDPR, right? Inquiry, right of uh, correction, right of uh, deletion or erasing, right of withdrawing authorization and consent, right of deleting PI account, right of obtaining PI copy, those kind of things are more or less similar. So um, then we talk about data security law. There's another one, yeah, data security law. Data security law, uh, there are a lot of things um, more about national security, um, the uh, uh, um, confidentiality of commercial secrets, right? Over, over companies, uh, something like that. Um, among those uh, obligations, there's one important obligation, which is about outbound data transfers. Um, those are obligations which uh, multinational companies are quite sensitive about because their companies will have to face the obligations, right? To observe in relation to outbound data transfers, right? So um, um, in terms of the uh, um, outbound data transfers, there are a lot of things to do. For example, you have to do Personal information uh, uh, impact assessment, right? When you when a multinational company, for example, transfers their data from within China to outside China, they have to do they have to follow a lot of things, a lot of internal controls, a lot of procedures. One of them would be personal information um, impact assessments. Right? How to do that? Um, more or less similar to that under GDPR. Right? Um, however, um, when a multinational company is in China, uh, provides critical data abroad, a key information in infrastructure operator, or a data processor processing the personal information of more than one million individual, then you have to follow the procedure to. Uh, do assessments, right? Where a data processor has provided personal information of 100,000 individuals or sensitive personal information of 10,000 individuals in total abroad since January 1st of the previous year, then you have to follow this kind of a process. Um, certainly, as I mentioned, there are three major specific laws about personal information, which is uh, data security law, personal information production, law, PIPO, and the data security law, right? Uh, those are major specific laws in relation to, in relation to personal information. However, there, there are some other um, legal authorities which are important as well, like civil code, right? Um, civil code provides for uh, the rights to sue, right? Uh, which means the victims could uh, file uh, civil lawsuits against uh, uh, inf infringers. So, um, so civil code is also an important uh, legal authority, right? And also criminal law. Um, bear in mind that um, violation of a person information could uh, bring about administrative liability civil liability as well as criminal liability uh, up to three to three to seven years right could be uh, could be a could be very serious right um as you may this kind of interpretation of a criminal law in relation to personal information right as you may see 
the threshold is quite low for triggering of uh, criminal liability. Illegal acquisition, sale, or provision of more than 20 pieces of whereabouts, communications, credit information, and property information, then criminal liability could be triggered, right? Uh, there's a real case about that. Um, for, for example, a disgruntled employee published on the website about, you know, the, the, the employee, uh, you know, was an employee of a real estate agent, agency, right? And the employee was fired and, uh, and he felt, you know, fired wrong. So he published some uh, property information of the clients of real estate agency on the internet, more than 50 piece, right? As you may see, you know, those are, you know, uh, personal information about property information, then the disgruntled employees uh, was, uh, was put in the jail for that. And also, uh, as you may see, you know, illegal obtaining, selling, or providing more than 5,000 pieces of personal information, right? Then, right, you know, as you can see here, you know, those are 50 pieces of sensitive information, right? However, about, uh, you know, um, non-sensitive information, right? Just the generic personal information. Uh, if the amount is uh, more than 50,000, then, you know, criminal liability could be triggered, right? Even those kind of a number of pieces of uh, personal information does not mean it. However, if the illegal income from the buying, selling the personal information is more than 5,000 yuan, which is about US dollar 720, the threshold is quite low, then there could be criminal liability. So, uh, risks are real. Then, which brings another topic, which is about how to do risk management, right? As you may know, um, I was the AP compliance director for Ford. So I was in charge of uh, uh, risk management, compliance management. So um, probably as, as lawyers, as legal practitioners, uh, an important topic is about how to do risk management, right? Um, uh, as per my perspective, I think you know risk on cybersecurity and the data governance could 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 trigger three kinds of uh, risks, which is about number one is about legal risk, right? Enterprises are punished by regulatory authorities for doing what law prohibits or not doing what law requires. That's legal risk and operational risk, for example. The risk of loss caused by non-subject intentional factors, you know, there's the just like operational risk, which means a fat finger, right? Just uh, inadvertently, accidentally, um, do something. However, cause loss, right? For example, um, cause the uh, system uh, defunction which causes the loss, a lot of personal information. Yeah, that's also a risk, right? Even the actor you know, didn't mean it, didn't intentionally do it. However, those kind of inadvertent action could cause the loss, right? So that's called operational risk. Fraud risk, right? Fraud risk, risk of being defrauded by ex external hackers or by internal employees, right? Uh, as I can um, tell you um, by some cases here, um, you know, legal risk is in red, fraud risk in, in purple and operational risk in green. So uh, risk profile like this, yeah, risk could stand alone, risk, could, risk could, could be added up. Then how to do the risk management, right? Uh, there are three, three principles, penetrating, uh, risk penetrating, uh, uh, collective management and initiative management uh, through the uh, uh, whole chain of the uh, sub, uh, through the whole supply chain, and also through the uh, different uh, defenses lines of in, in the company, 
then uh, the risk risk can be managed well. So there, there are some cases, you know, like uh, DNB, GLV, DNB is uh, quite familiar, uh, uh, quite, quite sounds uh, familiar to, to you guys, DNB. DN, DNB ha, ha, had a GLV in China, was found guilty of uh, infringing upon PII, and its directors were put into jail. Uh, that, that's a long time ago, in 2013, right? Um, the court found the DNB joint venture guilty of legally purchasing PII and fined the company about RMB 1 million. And uh, the staff who are directly in charge and others who are directly liable, you know, they are presidents, right? They are data and operation director, data manager, and data collector were put into jail. Uh, ironically, uh, GLV fund law has changed to provide a criminal liability and they hire a lawyer, ask lawyer whether or not we can do it in spite of the law, criminal law. The lawyer said, yes, you can do it, doesn't matter. You know? And then the, the, the DNB said, we have a contract, the contract of purchasing information data. Lawyer said, doesn't matter, change the name from the, the contract of purchasing information data into the contract on advice and a consultation for commercial data. Then uh, DNB uh, followed that advice, then they're in jail, right? And uh, you can follow the link to read the article in, in English. That's the common legal risk, right? Apple, uh, fraud risk, you know, the employees of an Apple store stole and sold PII, right? Um, you know, that's not uh, the, the liability of an uh, employee um, wasn't computing to the liability of uh, Apple Store, uh, which means you know those employees cost the fraud risk to Apple. Um, certainly, uh, there's a fine line between the fraud risk and the legal risk. You know, if there if if the Apple um, could not uh, show the court they were trying to uh, do risk management. Uh, there could be a criminal liability uh, for Apple Store as well and their uh, directors, their their managers. So there's a fine line. However, um, the risk for our risk is 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 there, and also operational risk. Right, um, the Huazhou operates the online hotel booking system for about four thousand hotels, and the dealer manage well the operational risk. For example, um, they didn't manage well the uh, classified uh, system, right? Cl classified protection system, as I uh, told you guys in the first place, right? And uh, then there, a lot of data were stolen uh, from, from the company. And uh, uh, ironically, the Huazhou uh, was the last one to know uh, their their data was on the sale on the internet, right? And uh, there were about 500 millions of PI items put, in, put, it, put into the market to sale. So that's, you, know, you can say there, there are legal risks, right? And also there are operational risks as well. So um, there are a lot of uh, uh, tools, there are a lot of uh, uh, systems, there are a lot of uh, ways, there are a lot of uh, products to manage the risks, like guidelines on PI integrity and cybersecurity, those kind of things, right? And uh, um, there's a best practice, which is about NESO, right? NESO did a very good job. Their employees, you know, bought about 120,000 items of PI of pregnant women or mothers from doctors and nurses in order to promote baby formula milk. And the six, six employees were, were sentenced with imprisonment from four to 18 months. And the lawyer was trying to defend those kind of uh, employees by saying those pair, those poor employees, they're just small potatoes, right? Just let them go, arrest those kind of uh, directors, managers of the NASO, right? They're big, they're big sharks. They're responsible for, for the actions of the employees. The court said, wait a minute, let's see what the court did, what, what, what NESO did. 
for risk management, they did a lot of things, right? So that's not liability for NASO, that's liability of individual employees, ensured compliance earns meaningful credits for NASO. So there are a lot of tools for handling the risks. We, we don't have time to mention. If you have more uh, you know, questions, please let us know. And you can see the, you can have my uh, PPTs and you can send emails to me, right? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chen. That was an extremely uh, interesting presentation uh, for me in particular, because I don't know much about Chinese state of protection laws and I now feel a lot better educated. I couldn't help but compare as you were going along, comparing um, the laws that you were describing with the laws in my country, Australia. Um, a lot of significant differences. Um, there's a lot of similarity between the laws you were describing in the GDPR, as you pointed out, whereas in Australia, we have no alignment with the GDPR at all at present. You also have a very different uh, process for authorizing overseas transfers of data. I think that's probably quite unique. Uh, and I was also interested in your comments about the civil code and criminal code, but there'll be time to discuss that later on. Um, now, for the benefit of our speakers, I'm changing the order of, of our speakers uh, simply because I've been having some discussions behind the scenes and we have a bit of a, a scheduling problem for one of our speakers. So uh, I'm going to invite um, Brinda Bandari to speak now. Brinda is from India and she's exceptionally well qualified. She's a Rhodes Scholar. She's a graduate of Oxford University. Uh, she practices in Delhi and she specializes in the field of digital rights, technology and privacy. So I'll be extremely interested to hear what she has to say. So I'll pass over to you now, Verinda. Thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, apologies for the scheduling change. Um, I'm so glad to be here. It's, uh, you know, it's very exciting to hear all these developments that are happening. Unfortunately, India hasn't really reach the, the stage. Uh, and so before I set the, get down to my presentation, I wanted to just give you a background about the journey of the data protection law in India, because I think that to some extent is, uh, is helpful for countries that don't already have a set data protection law. It's something we're seeing across countries in Asia and Africa. As countries are trying to enact a data protection law, what are some of the hurdles um, that can come into force? Uh, so we India has never had any data protection law, but we in 2017 the Supreme Court uh, gave a right to you know declared that there is a fundamental right to privacy. Uh, there was a constitutional court decision. There were lots of arguments. The government opposed it, but the Supreme Court was very clear and said that the right to privacy is a fundamental right that inures to all citizens of the country and to all persons. Um, given this, the government was then uh, forced to constitute a, a committee which was supposed to, which was tasked with looking at the issue of data protection and to come up with a bill. This committee, the Sri Krishna committee, for anybody who's well-versed with developments in India, um, came up with a draft law in 2018. In 2019, the government came out with its own version of the law. So they have made changes to the Sri Krishna committee version. And in 2019, the Indian government in parliament introduced the draft data protection bill. Uh, which is the PDP bill, which is what I will be referring to in my presentation. Uh, for two years, uh, the committee, there was a committee that was constituted within parliament. So it was a cross-parliamentary committee, across political parties. Uh, you know, you had members of parliament from across political parties, which formed part of this joint parliamentary committee. They heard stakeholder submissions. Uh, lots of people were invited to give comments. We, I mean, I myself gave comments to the committee. Uh, so for two years, this joint parliamentary committee was reviewing the data protection bill. And just last year, in December last year, they came out with certain, re recommended certain amendments to the government's version. Suddenly this year, two months ago, the government has now withdrawn the data protection bill from parliament and has said that it will come up with a new law. We have no timelines of when this law will come. We have no timelines of why this uh, we have no explanation for why this law was why the draft bill was uh, withdrawn we so the only hope we have is that as and when the government comes out with a new draft it can be more focused on privacy protections uh, and maybe less focused on government exemptions um so i'll just give a, with this brief background 
uh, data protection currently in India, given that we do not have a data protection law, is under the Information Technology Act. Uh, so the inf data protection, as you can see, is data protection under the Information Technology Act and under the Personal Data Protection Bill. Currently, our only statutory remedies are under the Information Technology Act. Now, the problem with the Information Technology Act is that it is very, very inadequate. Uh, there are only two sections in the entire act that deal with data and privacy. The rest of the act deals with electronic signatures, uh, you know, surveillance powers of the government, blocking powers of the government, uh, web cybersecurity issues, uh, intermediaries. Uh, so there's only two sections that deal with data and privacy that requires the liability of corporate entities, uh, which means that every corporate entity is tasked with ensuring uh, that they put in place reasonable security practices such that it can protect the personal data and privacy of individuals. And there is a certain punishment uh, for failure to undertake these actions. And there is also punishment for any false disclosure of information. Under this section 49, 43A, which is the liability of corporate entities, the government has enacted uh, various rules. And these rules define, uh, which are called the sensitive personal data information rules, the SPDI rules. They define what is sensitive personal data, they say that every company must have a privacy policy. They prescribe a certain manner of collection of information, disclosure of information. What then is the problem? The problem with the law is twofold. One, it excludes the government entirely from the ambit of data protection. Now, as we know, especially in India, the government is one of the largest data controllers or what we in India refer to as the data fiduciaries. Uh, it collects the data of you know, a billion citizens uh, through government schemes, through tax purposes. Uh, but the IT Act, under the Information Technology Act, the government is excluded from its ambit. So it's impossible to have any statutory remedy against the government for any data protection breach. Even when it comes to corporates, the rules are completely inadequately enforced. We don't have a functioning tribunal that can deal with disputes. Um, over the years, there has not even been a single case of uh, a judgment that deals with the interpretation of the prosecution of companies uh, for failure to maintain data protection standards under the IT Act. Um, so the situation is very dire and we urgently need a data protection bill. Which leads me to what are the definitions of data, data and what are the understanding of data that have been come under the data protection bill. This is what I'm going to use as our sort of uh, governing framework, uh, so to speak. Um, so the data protection bill, it's a personal data protection bill. It deals with, um, it deals with data, uh, personal data and non-personal data. The scope of the bill is currently only with personal data. Non-personal data, which is anonymized data, is excluded from the purview of the bill. Notably, the Joint Parliamentary Committee actually recommended changing this. They said we should have a comprehensive data protection law which would cover both personal and non-personal data. This was actually heavily criticized uh, by many, many commentators saying it's going to become very confusing. People will have no idea because the standards are very different. Non-personal data regulation, especially what we've been seeing in the EU, is very much focused on deriving commercial value from data. Whereas personal data regulation is meant to be ensuring the privacy of the individual. So the, the ideas and the, the motivations behind the, both these laws is actually different. Now, personal data is divided into personal data, sensitive personal data, and something called critical data. Uh, so everything that is data, uh, is either divided into NPD, no, non-personal data, or personal data and sensitive personal data. Critical personal data that you see here is a third category that is undefined under the law, which is pretty surprising. But it is supposed to be data that will be defined as and when the government defines it. Uh, but it is data that cannot, for all practical purposes, leave the Indian shores. So we expect it to be data such as the health data of the president of India, the health data of the prime minister of India. So data that is... Uh, very sensitive and personal and important to the country's national security as seen by the government. Uh, so this is called critical personal data. Uh, so you have personal data, sensitive personal data and critical personal data. Um, as you can see, so all that is personal data is also sensitive personal data. Now, what is personal data? It's a fairly inclusive and a wide definition. It's data relating to any natural person and any inference that may be drawn from their profiling. So it's name, email address, ID, gender, and more importantly, it can directly or indirectly relate to a certain individual. So intellectual property, IP addresses, sorry, um, can also be part of personal data. 
Now, if you look at, consider the example of an author, an author's email address and a mobile number can identify them. So it would constitute them, constitute personal data. Even an individual zip code in our author example, an author or a customer, their zip code and their gender uh, that can indirectly identify them will be characterized as personal data. Sensitive personal data is personal data that may be related to financial data. So that's your bank accounts, credit card statements, health data, biometric data. So your genetic data, DNA profiling, health is any medical record. These are very broadly defined. Genetic data, which would be specifically DNA data, whereas bio, biometric would be more iris, uh, you know, iris data, fingerprints, those sorts of things. Official identifier, which is your, uh, in India, as many of you uh, may know, we have an Aadhaar card. Uh, it's the biometric identity card that all Indians have. Um, so that would be an official identifier. Your passport would be an official identifier. Now, this is an interesting category, caste or tribe. Um, this actually is also potentially problematic because in India, your name can often reflect your caste. And so treating, while it's uh, the intention behind treating this as sensitive personal data may be, uh, may be a good intention. In practice, it will actually cause a lot of problems for companies if they have to treat all this data as uh, sensitive personal data. And the other interesting thing is data related to sexual orientation, transgender status, and religious or political beliefs or affiliations. A lot of this is uh, inspired by the GDPR, but then with an Indian uh, twist added to it. Uh, the central government can add to this list. Um, now, what is the difference between personal data and non-personal data in terms of the obligations that are placed on companies? So more specifically, under the law, uh, while you necessarily just have to take consent, uh, while consent is one of the categories for processing personal data, for processing sensitive personal data, you need something called explicit consent, which hasn't really been defined in the law, but it requires a higher level of like notice. Uh, you know, you have to se segregate all the notice. So the data that you're collecting for 10 different purposes, you should reveal it's for those 10 different purposes. Um, so, you know, it's a higher threshold in some senses of explicit consent. That's the first difference. The second major difference is on in the context of storage. So personal data can be stored anywhere across the country, uh, you know, uh, but sensitive personal data must be stored in India. It can be mirrored abroad, but it absolutely must be stored in India. And this has been a very controversial provision. I will go to data localization later, but this has been a controversial provision because companies are worried about um, the increased costs. A lot of companies in India store their data in Singapore or in parts of the EU. Uh, depending on whether they're GDPR compliant or they have business in Singapore. So for them to mandatorily keep the data in India uh, is something that will be very costly. There's also huge environmental implications of actually having so many data centers. And activists and civil society organizations are concerned about the surveillance implications of storing, of mandatorily storing data in India. Non-personal data, uh, as you know, is anonymized data. And as I've mentioned, the Data Protection Bill of 2021, as recommended by the Joint Parliamentary Committee, uh, would bring non-personal data within its uh, ambit. The Data Protection Bill defines two entities that deal with personal data, which is data fiduciaries and data processors. So data fiduciaries are simply data controllers. But in India, the term of fiduciary was chosen uh, because the Sri Krishna Committee, which I had referred to earlier, felt that data controllers has a real control and subject aspect to it. Uh, whereas fiduciary is a more equal and equitable relationship and also ensuring a relationship of trust. So that was the logic behind it. Uh, so that's, you know, what would be classified as a data controller in India is called a data fiduciary. And then a data processor is a, you know, is an entity that processes personal data on behalf of or under the instructions of a data fiduciary. Uh, Indian law also defines something called a significant data fiduciary. So this is classified by the regulator, the data protection authority on the basis of volume of data, sensitivity of data, turnover, risk of harm, use of new technologies for processing, and any other factor causing harm from such processing. The rationale behind is that such data fiduciaries or such companies may be in the position to cause significantly greater harm to individuals while you know, processing their personal data. And this harm has been defined as financial loss, loss of property, loss of uh, reputation, and discriminatory treatment. Um, so significant data fiduciaries, once you're classified as a significant data fiduciary, you also have additional obligations. These obligations can be in the form of a mandatory data protection impact assessment, uh, data audits. Uh, you have to, you know, data auditors will be appointed who will give you trust posts. This is an innovation under Indian law uh, that's been envisaged. We have no idea how it will work in practice, uh, but it is one of the things that has sort of is seen as 
a new idea. Um, so you will have data auditors, uh, data, you know, you'll have more higher retention obligations if you're a significant data fiduciary. You have to mandatorily appoint a data protection officer. So essentially all large companies in the government would be classified as a significant data fiduciary. Now, the, our data protection law is built on these four principles. It's premised on these four principles. There is notice and consent, um, which mandates fiduciaries to notify data principles and seek their consent. There's data minimization, uh, which says that all data collected must be adequate, limited, relevant to what is necessary. Storage limitation, the idea that you should not retain personal data for longer than needed. Purpose limitation, which means that personal data collected for one purpose should not be used for a new and incompatible purpose. So one interesting thing that uh, was clarified under the Data Protection Bill in India, which is not there currently in our existing law, is the idea which a lot of you will already be familiar with, that bundled consents are not permitted. So something like this, which requires you to accept the terms in terms of use, the privacy policy, and requires you to receive a weekly newsletter from the company, uh, would actually not be allowed anymore as because it would be seen as bundled consent. This is an example of granular consent, which is actually the preferred mode, which the data protection bill uh, recommends and advocates for. Uh, now, there are certain exceptions to the principle of notice and consent. This is when it is necessary for the purpose of employment. So anything that relates to personal data only, when it relates to recruitment or termination, any service or benefit, any day, uh, in, uh, assessment of the employee or their attendance then the company does not need to take their consent. Um, when it's for any reasonable purposes, which have been defined as whistleblowing, mergers and acquisitions, credit scoring, recovery of debt, processing of publicly available personal data, operation of search engines, such as Wikipedia, you would not need consent. Then the first category, which I've left for the last, is when it is necessary for the performance of government functions. So this is an exception uh, to the provision of consent, which is fairly broadly, uh, which is fairly broadly worded. Uh, and states that uh, when it is necessary for the performance of government functions, such as the provision of uh, biometrics, like uh, the provision of food subsidies, then no consent is required. So this is the idea of an exception uh, to the principle of notice and consent. This is very different from the exemption that the government is given under the Data Protection Bill, which is one of the most controversial provisions of the bill, which allows the government to exempt itself or any government agency from the entire provision of the bill. So this goes beyond the GDPR. So it allows the government exemption from the entire provision of the bill. Uh, as long as the government feels it is necessary in national security, if it's for public order, um, you know, if it's for the security of the state, for friendly relations between countries. Uh, so it's a very broadly worded exemption. And there are almost uh, any safeguards that will be prescribed will only be prescribed through rules. So we actually don't know what these safeguards are, which is a big problem. Uh, data uh, storage and retention is uh, very important when we think about CCTV footage, call records, financial data, uh, you know, subscriber information, uh, author cookies, etc. Now, children's data. India has a very interesting uh, children's data provision. Uh, it, uh, a child is defined under the age of 18, so it's a much higher age of consent than most countries across the world. You have to verify the age of the person, and if it's a child, you must obtain parental consent. Uh, Companies are also, I'm sorry, uh, companies are also prohibited from profiling, tracking, engaging in behavioral monitoring or di you know, directing targeted advertising. So the provisions here uh, are fairly significant and they are modeled on the lines of COPPA, which is the American law. The data protection officer, as I've mentioned, is somebody that uh, every significant data fiduciary must employ, who is going to be the point of contact and going to ensure with, uh, with the customers and is going to ensure compliance with the law. Uh, we then come to the idea of data localization, which I've already mentioned is uh, was one of the more controversial provisions. And under data localization provisions, uh, sorry, under data localization provisions, all personal data must be stored in India, where a sensitive personal data, uh, sorry, all personal data can be stored anywhere in the world. Sensitive personal data must be stored in India, and it can be transferred abroad or can be mirrored abroad, rather. Uh, in any other country, as long as certain conditions are met. So you need the approval of the regulator, if the country is on a white list, um, if the customers expressly consent to it. Um, so these are some of the conditions. All critical personal data has to stay in India. It almost can never be uh, sent abroad, uh, unless it's for exceptional medical 
uh, or health emergencies. Um, data breach, India has had a huge problem with data breach as with many other countries in the world. So the law seeks to put a data breach notification uh, principle. However, companies are only obliged to notify the regulator. There is no obligation to notify uh, the customers or the users directly. Um, so that in short uh, was, uh, was my presentation. As I've mentioned, uh, some of the big discussions and the debate points in India are about what is going to happen next. Uh, what is the standard of law that is applicable currently? Uh, we are governed by a Supreme Court judgment. So there are constitutional principles of privacy that are applicable, but there are no statutory principles of privacy that, that would apply against the go uh, government, especially or private companies. Thank you very much, Farinda. I thought that was a fascinating uh, summary of the, of the legal developments in India in this area. And as with previous speakers, I, I can't help but relate it back to the experience in Australia and, and, and look at the comparisons, the similarities and the lack of similarities. And what your very opening comment um, resonated with me when you talked about the Supreme Court establishing a, a fundamental right to privacy. That debate has been going on for nearly 100 years in Australia. Um, back in 1933, our High Court, which is our, our Superior Court, yeah. uh, declared that there was no right to privacy at common law. And then in 2003, the High Court sort of revisited it, but wasn't clear. And different judges expressed themselves in different ways. And since then, different courts around Australia have been interpreting the High Court judgment. Um, uh, some some courts tending to choose the parts they like and ignoring the parts they don't like. So that's been a very interesting debate. Um, beyond that, the um, your, your discussion about the bill was very interesting. There were some very familiar concepts in there that that, are, um, that sort of resonate across all of, all the different legislation we've been hearing about yeah. today. But also some delightfully unique Indian aspects, I thought. Um, your definition of sensitive personal information has its own uh, local peculiarities, which I found interesting. And also the concept of critical personal yes. data is not one that, that many jurisdictions ha have, have embraced. So yeah. you gave us a lot to think about. Thank now, you. I'm going to, I'm still juggling speakers here. And I think Johan is keen to go next. Um, if, if that's okay, um, uh, uh, Mr. Mori will just have to wait. Um, uh, so our next speaker is from Indonesia, Mr. Johan uh, Hetepi Engel. Um, he is the founding partner of an internationally recognised law firm in Jakarta. Um, um, uh, and he has extensive experience at a very sound reputation in relation to uh, conducting major cross-border transactions. So in the context of um, data protection, that's a very relevant background and we'll be very interested to listen to what he has to say. Thank you, Johan. Thank you, Dr. Hughes, uh, for the uh, kind introduction and um, good evening, um, participants and uh, fellow panelists and moderators. Uh, I know it's late, and I, 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 I sincerely apologize to Maurice and say that um, I have to come first. Uh, I have a, uh, another engagement that, at, at just before eight. So I uh, thank you. I'd like, uh, I can go first. Um, okay. Um, I will talk about the uh, Indonesian uh, personal data protection laws and regulations and um, I apologize if I'm unable to uh, compare our regulations with uh, Chinese regulations because we don't have the expertise on China, China laws and uh, we didn't wanna even try to pretend that we're a specialist of Chinese laws, nor GDPR, but uh, the more uh, uh, relevant uh, reference that's usually used is GDPR, so we compare our position with the GDPR. And I, I thank you. I thank Mr. Chen earlier, who's given us the uh, overview of the Chinese laws on, on data protection. Um, I, I start off with a fairly strong sentence and, and, and to say that Indonesia is behind in terms of um, 
personal data protection. If, uh, we've heard from the other panelists um, earlier that they've had their data protection laws going back as far as um, that was uh, there was one in 2000. Five, the three that became effective in 2005, and we, we don't even have that. Um, the uh, regime now in Indonesia is that the protection of personal information is scattered uh, in various um, uh, laws and regulations. Um, you have the uh, health law that deals with your health information, you have the uh, banking law that deals with your banking information, and and you have the telecommunications law that deal with your, you know, private information and in, in it comes to telecommunications. So it's a, it's a different uh, scheme altogether. And there is no one single law that deals with the uh, uh, personal data protection. Um, we also have the uh, electronic and information in electronic information and transactions law or the EIT law that um, uh, sets out certain uh, governing rules for uh, information, uh, um, digital information, uh, electronic information, including personal data information. And this law was issued in 2008, and then this was uh, amended in 2016, not because of GDPR, but you know um, there was just a, a separate amendment. And then uh, there were a couple of uh, government regulations, government regulation number 82, which then uh, was replaced by government regulation number 71, 2019. And also there's a Minister of Communication and Infor Informatics Regulation um, uh, number 20 of 2016. Now this is again, uh, almost like the sole reference for uh, us in terms of uh, personal data protection, especially in the uh, electronic or digital uh, regime. Um, the GR, the, the government regulation uh, 71, 2019 is a, a much better improvement than the uh, predecessor um, regulation. Um, it's, it has adopted uh, certain uh, functions or features that are existent in the uh, more mature jurisdiction in comes, when it comes down to um, data protection. So the elements of lawful consent, purpose limitation, data minimization, and so on, they, they all exist in the uh, GR 71, 2019. So this, in a way it shows that Indonesia is not closing itself to the development outside Indonesia, because it is, as a matter of fact, with technology, you know, we've become like it or not, uh, such a global village, you know, border is just, there's no real border unless um, in, in terms of the digit, digital age. Um, <clears throat> although we don't have that, um, one single law that deals with um, data protection. Um, the parliament and the government are, um, I should say, have been working on a bill on uh, the personal data protection bill. Um, this began in or about uh, 2015. And until now, the bill has not been passed at the uh, parliament. Um, we understand that most of the uh, um, primary issues or concerns have been agreed by the parliament and the government. Uh, but despite that information, uh, the bill has not been passed. Um, we've heard that the bill would be passed by the end of this year, but you know, last year we also heard the same thing. Um, so we, we can't really uh, be sure when the bill is going to be um, issued. Now, the uh, PDP bill, um, uh, ex if it's um, enacted or passed in its current form and substance, um, it would provide higher standards of data protection regime and across 
sectoral. So it's, it's, it would try to capture different sectors uh, of the uh, uh, fields, and then um, it will be one single reference for the uh, data protection. Now, the latest draft that, that we have that's publicly available uh, does refer to uh, concepts that are influenced heavily by the GDPR. You know, there's an acknowledgement of controller and processor. There's a sensitive data concept. And there will also be a data protection officer and, and, and so on. Um, on that note, um, the need of this uh, PDP law is quite urgent at the moment, given that the fact, given the fact that uh, we've had some breaches um, recently, um, and the breaches are quite serious, no, I are serious, and they're, they're, they're from different uh, sectors. So we have the private sector data breach, and we also have the government sector or public sector uh, uh, data breach. Uh, for example, um, in, in 2021, uh, there's a, a health insurance company whose data were leaked or breached, and it was reported that uh, about 2 million customers uh, data were um, breached and hacked by, um, we don't know who, but yeah, it was hacked. And in late 2020, uh, two major e-commerce uh, companies in Indonesia also suffered um, uh, data breaches. And as a result of that, <coughs> this is interesting, um, there was a class action suit filed by a certain, a certain group of consumer protection uh, uh, organization. And they were trying to uh, request the uh, court. It, it, this was filed to the uh, district court, which uh, oversees uh, uh, and decides uh, civil matters, including class actions. Uh, however, in, in this particular case, one of the uh, prayers of the uh, plaintiffs was that um, they wanted the court to issue a ruling uh, to, to request the company or to order the company to discontinue the uh, certain action or non-action by the, uh, these companies. And the court, unfortunately, um, uh, 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 dismissed the case, not even looking at the uh, substance. Uh, so the case was dismissed on technicality uh, because they say that this was the wrong court for the uh, plaintiffs to seek a, what they call a government ruling instead of a court ruling or court order. So it, it is uh, kind of, it is a serious um, issue and we do need the uh, PDP bill to be uh, issued and passed uh, fairly quickly. Yeah, on the public sector side, the, uh, <coughs> the, Social Security um, uh, Agency, um, you know, um, suffered some security breach or um, leak leakage of data, which included the uh, certain inform personal information of the participants of the social security programs. And you, you could see the uh, um, resident identity numbers, addresses, phone numbers, email address, and even photos of the participants were, were leaked. Um, the uh, contact tracing application developed by the government, it's called Puduli Lindungi, also reportedly had a breach, which uh, also dealt with certain <coughs> um, personal data. Now, more recently, most recently, uh, there have been reports of a breach or a hack by certain hackers uh, that were able to hack and um, obtain information relating to the uh, communication between the office of the president and the uh, uh, state intelligence agency. So it is a serious problem and um, uh, it is time for the uh, parliament and government to proceed uh, to you know, uh, immediately um, legislate and um, issue the PDP law. Okay. Um, just a, a quick comparison uh, analysis or, or comparison 
points of uh, Indonesian regulatory uh, on data protection uh, versus a GDPR. Um, I'm just go gonna go through this quickly. So the EIT, Electronic Information Transaction Regulatory Framework, does not recognize a separation between a controller and a processor. Um, it's at the moment lumped into one uh, uh, term that is called uh, 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 public uh, PSE. Electronic, electronic system operator and electronic system operator and ESO. So that's that's what it is and it, it's it's both a processor and a, a, a controller. So if you look at the next full point, it is an ESO. This is um, also, as I mentioned earlier, will be a change in the PDP law if it's issued in its current. Um, form and substance because the PDP law will <coughs> uh, introduce a, a, a separation of parties in the processing uh, that is the controller and the processor just like GDPR. Okay, um, the uh, next comparison point is that GDPR's uh, principles, uh, lawfulness, purpose limitation, and data minimization, data accuracy, storage limitation, data security, and accountability. Um, the current existing and applicable uh, uh, regulation that is GR 71 2019 acknowledges the, these principles, okay? Um, however, the consent, the ex explicit and express consent is still required. So that those are not the substitute for the consent, but rather those are in addition to the uh, consent. Now, the PDP, um, once enacted, um, uh, will have the same uh, principle that, but it will allow the uh, lawful and fair and transparent um, uh, use without the consent of the data subjects. So that will be a, a significant difference when the PDP law is uh, issued, which it, it, at least in our experience dealing with companies would, would, would be uh, treated favorably because uh, there are certain things that uh, a company uh, is required to do under the law. For instance, yeah, they have to to collect information uh, 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 of their employees to comply with the law. Now, I'm talking now uh, in the, the second, uh, the first <coughs> point on on this slide that is the uh, lawful grounds for personal data processing processing activities. For instance, in Indonesia, an employer is required to register and uh, 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 to register their employees with a, the social security program. Now in the process, they would need to get the certain personal information of those employees. Now, if we don't have the consent from those employees for us to process and uh, uh, store and um, transfer the information, then we could, in theory, be in, be in breach of uh, this existing regulation, but um, we're doing it for us to comply with the law. So when the PDB bill is issued in this form, hopefully this will, will assist uh, companies in doing their uh, uh, compliance. Um, for consent, we moved from deemed consent to lawful consent. Um, this is uh, similar to the approach to that of the uh, GDPR. Um, it has to be specific, uh, freely given, unambiguous, and it must be informed. So it's an informed consent. Um, the PDP law, when it's enacted, will affirm those, but with uh, some addition that is the, cons the consent requirement will need to be in clear and plain language and easy to read uh, format. Yes. Uh, notification. Um, under the current regime, uh, under the current rules, any data breach must be notified to the data subjects. Uh, it has to be notified within 14 days after the knowledge of the breach, meaning um, when the 
ESO is aware of the uh, breeds and it has to notify the uh, data subject. At the moment, there isn't really a, uh, an agency or a body uh, that will be uh, required for us to, to, to inform. But the PDP bill contemplates that there will be a, a body that oversees the uh, data protection and to whom uh, the ESOs or data uh, processors yeah, need to inform any breach. Uh, the timing is extended somewhat, it's 72 hours upon another breach, but the uh, ESOs will be required to submit the information to both the MOCHI at the moment uh, or the uh, agency at the, when the time comes and the data subjects about the, the breach. And the uh, notice will also need to inform what the breach war is and when it took place and any measures taken by the uh, uh, company or the ESOs in order to handle and uh, mitigate the uh, uh, breach. Okay. Um, one moment. Yeah. Um, now, this is um, different if we compare it to the uh, uh, EU and um, Singapore, because earlier there was a mention about this. Um, there is no distinction between, um, I, th there is no uh, element whether or not the data breach causes uh, uh, any high risk or, or freedom of a uh, natural person, or it's a less or likely only to result in a, in, in a risk. There is no such distinction. To us, a, a breach is a breach. So we need to, to, to inform that uh, unlike in, in, in other jurisdiction. Um, last point that I'd like to raise here is the uh, enforcement. <coughs> um, there is no specific uh, threshold amount as the basis for to calculate any administrative uh, financial penalty, unlike in GDPR. Uh, and there, the EIT law, uh, unlawful processing of personal data without a consent, that is, uh, may be subject to fines and imprisonment. Again, though, uh, we don't see a, 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 a regular or any enforcement for that matter by the uh, relevant authority uh, on, on the breach of data protection, um, especially um, no, no criminal um, prosecution that, that, that we've seen. The PDP bill, when it's uh, approached, will also have the uh, similar approach, and that is that there will be fines and imprisonment sanctions for uh, any party that violates the uh, PDP law. Okay, next. Uh, with that, that was my... Uh, quick overview of what uh, our current rules and regulations on data protection. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll be open to Q&A session uh, later on. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. Thank you, uh, Johannes. That was uh, very interesting. I, I was, you had a very captivating opening line when you said we are behind. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but it made me reflect that, that you can have uh, legislation and still be behind. Uh, in, in, in my country, we enacted our Privacy Act in 1988. But, wow. Uh, so in one sense, we were ahead of the game, but our Attorney General's Department released a report earlier this year pointing out all the deficiencies in that act which need to be rectified, essentially to bring it into line with the, with the more into line with the GDPR. So... Um, one of the advantages of being slow to enact specific legislation might, might be that you'll, you'll get it right the first time, <laughs> but time will tell. Yes, um, thank, thank you. you for that. I'm glad you can remain, and I know you have to go on the, on the dot of finishing time. Um, now, we turn to the ever-patient Mr. Maury. Change the, the, the order. Um, uh, Mr. Maury is a partner in the uh, firm OU and Itoga, 
which is an uh, international firm with uh, numerous uh, in uh, Tokyo, Shanghai, Vietnam, Uzbekistan, Moscow. Uh, and like other speakers today, he's got a particularly strong practice in the area of cross-border, or well, a lot of experience in the area of, of cross-border transactions, which is really underpins the whole relevance of, of data protection laws in, in my view. So I'll be very interested to hear from Mr. Mori. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. Hello, everyone. My name is Keita Mori. I have not expected to be the last speaker, but I think uh, Dr. Hughes' uh, judgment is very excellent because uh, half of the speaker uh, listeners uh, must be uh, Japanese lawyers, so uh, they <laughs> do not have to uh, listen to my presentation. Yeah, but um, I am a member of <clears throat> International Committee of Tokyo Bar Association. I would like to briefly introduce Japanese personal data protection laws. <clears throat> All right. Here's a uh, table of contents. Uh, first, I will introduce basic information and the features of Japanese personal data protection. And second, uh, the latest amendments in Japan. Finally, I will introduce framework of regulations on cross-border transfer. First one is basic information. Uh, the name of Japanese law is uh, Act on the Protection of Personal Information. Um, APPI was enacted in 2003 and uh, is reviewed at least every three years. And recently, APPI was amended in June 2020 and May 2021. <clears throat> and Raj came into effect on APT 1st, uh, 2022. Um, <clears throat> Personal Information Protection Commission is the government commission responsible for the enforcement of APPI. And uh, on January 23rd, 2019, Japan and the EU mutually acknowledged uh, adequacy of protection. Since then, transfer of personal information to a third party in EU or England is not treated as transfer to a third party in a foreign country in the context of application of APPI. Features. Maybe these are the features or characteristics of not only personal information protection laws, but also mobile registration in Japan. First, foreseeability. There are a lot of rules and guidelines, and so it is relatively easy for business operator to find out what to do in every situation. Traceability. One of the important concepts of Japanese personal information protection laws is traceability. Business operators must keep records when they acquire or transfer personal data, even in situations in which notification to an individual is not required or in the situation, the individual's consent is not required, which means that business operators do not have to actively provide such records to an individual. But once an individual requests a business operator to disclose such records, the business operator must provide such records. Many similar and confusing concepts. There are many detailed guidelines covering a variety of situations, but there are many similar and confusing concepts. And so the guidelines are not necessarily easy to read. <clears throat> Next part is the latest amendment. There are many important points. Many business operators need to adjust their operations in accordance with the latest amendment. First one is report and notification. If personal data are leaked or destroyed or disappeared, in many situations, 
business operators must notify PBC and individuals. Next one is changes in requirements before cross-border transfer. Before business operators do cross-border transfer, they need to provide more information with respect to the foreign country, such as the foreign country's legal system related to personal information protection. Next one is disclosure. Even before the amendment, individuals can request business operators to disclose specific information in certain situations, but they can choose the methods of disclosure. After the amendment, individuals can choose a method of disclosure, such as an electronic format. Also, after the amendment, individuals can request business operators to disclose more information in more situations. Next one is new, important, and confusing concept, information related to an individual. Amended APPI adopted the concept of information related to an individual. This is for coping with the situation in which certain information is not personal data for a provider, means a business operator who provides the information, but at the same time, the same information may be personal data for a receiver means another business operator who receives the information. Since the information, because the information includes a cookie or other identifier, which only enables the receiver to combine with other information. Last but not least, penalties were strengthened and investigative powers were extended to foreign business operators. The last part is framework of regulations on cross-border transfer. More precise, precisely, regulations on provision to a third party in a foreign country. Here, I need to mention one point. In Japan, there is no separate obligation to keep personal data in Japan, in data localization obligation, as long as business operators comply with regulations on cross-border transfer. For provision to a third party in a foreign country, business operators must satisfy both of requirements on provision to a third party in a foreign country and also requirements on provision to a third party. Requirements on provision to a third party in a foreign country. There are some exceptions. Major one is EU and England. Transfer of personal information to a third party in EU or England is not treated as transfer to a third party in a foreign country. If, <clears throat> but even if any of the exceptions applies, we need to be aware of the separate requirements on provision to a third party. If no such exceptions applies, an individual's consent is required. Before the consent, certain information should be provided, must be provided regarding the cross-border transfer, such as name of the foreign country, the foreign country legal system for protection of personal information, and measures taken by the third party for the protection of personal information. Also, business operators must comply with requirements on provision to a third party. As a general rule, an individual's consent is necessary for provision of personal data to a third party, but there are some exceptions. Opt-out mechanics can be used in certain situations, but recently the applicable situations were narrowed. Also, 
The opt-out mechanism cannot be used for certain information, such as sensitive personal information, which is called special care required personal information in APPI. Entrustment, business succession, joint use with specific persons. In these situations, individual consent is not required. <coughs> Entrustment. <coughs> An entrustee is not treated as a third party, but an entrustee must not use personal data beyond the scope of the entrustment. Also, a business operator shall supervise the entrustee for the security of the personal data. Joint use with specific persons. Another exception is joint use with specific persons such as joint use with subsidiaries. If certain conditions are met, the specific persons are not treated as third parties. Before the joint use, certain information must be notified or kept in the state easily known by an individual. Information are the fact that personal data will be jointly used, categories of personal data, scope of specific persons, purpose use, and others. Finally, here is summary. First, as the features of Japanese personal information protection laws, there are many guidelines, but not easy to read, very confusing. Maybe we members of Tokyo Bar Association can help you or help your client. Second, considering the latest amendment, many business operators need to adjust their operations, especially their websites or privacy policies. It might be a good idea to contact members of Tokyo Bar Association immediately because the latest amendment already became effective on April 1st this year. Finally, the framework of regulations on cross-border transfer is a little bit confusing. Please be careful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mori. That was very, um, very well uh, set out and, and very easy to follow and, and very interesting. I think it's um, it, it makes Australian lawyers envious the fact that. Um, Japan received an adequacy decision from the EU in relation to the GDPR in 2019. Australia, which was very proud of its uh, uh, being an early innovator of privacy law, was very disappointed way back in 2001 when, when it failed to get an uh, adequate, uh, adequacy uh, decision under the predecessor of the GDPR. And that remains the case. And Australia's case, it's because we have some very curious exceptions um, in our laws, which which the EU didn't like. Uh, our Privacy Act, for example, doesn't apply to small businesses, businesses with an annual turnover of less than three million Australian dollars per annum, and it doesn't apply to it doesn't apply to employee records, which. Um, uh, is a rather curious exception. There are reasons for it, but it's it's out of date. Um, so quite clearly, and for a lot of the reasons you've explained, uh, Japanese law is up to date and keeping ahead of the majority of other countries. Now, we have some time for some questions. Um, does Mr. Tanaka have his hand up? Or am I mentioning that? No, no, he doesn't. Uh, or maybe I could ask the other speakers, do they have any additional comments they'd like to make or observations they'd like to make about what they've heard? Oh, actually, Mr. Ch uh, Chen, I've got a question for you, um, which someone has posed. Um, does the Chinese data protection law also apply to the Chinese government? You're on mute. Uh, the answer is yes. 
um, uh, organizations um, uh, is supposed to observe the obligations uh, under the uh, data protection law. You know, for example, in, in terms of national security, uh, those kind of things. Yes, the answer. Yeah. And I've got a question for Johans, but anyone can answer it. Um, you mentioned that you've had this draft legislation since 2015 and it hasn't yet been enacted. I'd be interested to know why hasn't it been enacted? Is, is it because of political disagreement? Is it because of ongoing legal debate? What, what, um, what, what, what's the stumbling block? The uh, stumbling block, uh, Dr. Hughes, is that uh, there's one, the, the, probably there, there's more, but one primary um, significant third stumbling block is the who the uh, authority uh, will be that will oversee the enforcement um, of data protection. The uh, government, the government, president and his ministers, uh, wants that to be in the be, uh, below the Ministry of Communication and for Informatics. So as a, a part of the a ministry, the parliament wants that to be an independent body so that it could, and then it will also have some sort of uh, 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 enforcement power. So that's the stumbling block. Once that's resolved, other issues uh, would, would be uh, resolved as well. So that is the stumbling block. But again, we're hearing that this is a, 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 a priority bill that needs to be uh, enacted and approved by this year, but you know, time will tell. Thank you. Um, it's very interesting. In Australia, we have, um, uh, we have delays in enacting changes to our privacy legislation. And sort of in parallel, we've had an ongoing debate about whether there should be a legislated general right to privacy, not so much data protection, but you know, freedom from intrusion. Uh, and there have been a lot of calls for it from uh, the public and from advocacy bodies over a number of decades, but nothing happens. And I think the reason is that the media in Australia, which is very powerful, is very opposed to it. And as soon as someone suggests a legislated right to privacy, the newspaper editorials immediately go into overdrive and say this is really, really bad for freedom of speech or whatever reason they want to use. But in broad terms, of course, it's not in the media's interests to, to have information less accessible. Um, and from the government's point of view, they can't afford to upset the media. So that uh, we've made absolutely no progress at all on, in that debate in, uh, after 15 years. Um, Mr. Mori or Mr. Chen, do you have a, has there been discussion in your countries about a general right to privacy, not so much data protection, but just um, uh, the right of people not to be spied on or eavesdropped on or um general intrusion from the media is that a question for for whom um, well, well uh, i'm interested in either country in in china or or, or japan um, Intru intrusion from media i'm interested to know whether people think there should be a general law that protects people's privacy or whether the prevailing view is that it's in the national interest or the government in particular to have an overriding power to um, uh, supervise people in the, in the, for, in the national interest. Mm, uh, that's a quite sensitive uh, question. Uh, yeah. First, yeah, first of all, uh, certainly China has uh, kind of a uh, comprehensive uh, legislations um, to protect the privacy of people, right? 
And uh, in terms of uh, the political question, I, I would rather not answer either way. <laughs> so I can say something like, uh, would law be uh, applicable to a uh, government? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, for example, as I mentioned in the presentation about uh, classified protection system, I hope you still remember it, uh, which, me which means, you know, this kind of system is, uh, is, is meant to uh, protect the system from being hacked, right? Um, uh, you know, Chinese government agencies uh, are required to adopt a uh, classified protection system uh, to protect their system from being hacked. Um, before the adoption of the system, uh, a lot of uh, Chinese agencies, government agencies, their web website could be hacked and uh, the uh, contents could be replaced with, you know, original contents could be replaced with some kind of pornography pictures as well as some other political slogans. So with the uh, uh, adoption of the uh, uh, classified protection system, uh, this uh, situation uh, disappeared um, largely. Um, yeah, that's kind of a, a more uh, flavor to the first question. Yeah, and, and thank you, a, a very comprehensive answer. Um, are there any other comments that any of the panelists would like to make about any aspect of their presentations which they'd like to elaborate on or anything that's been raised by any other speakers? Um, because now, now it'd be a good time. Oh, I've got a question while you're thinking about that. Um, Mr. Patrick from the audience is raising his hand. Mr. Patrick, would you like to raise your question, please? Mr. Prantic, I think. You're on mute. Good evening, all. Uh, what I would like to know from the Indian panelist is uh, how a zip code can be connected with somebody's personal information. That is one. And second thing, uh, you mentioned that, uh, that uh, mergers and acquisition will be an exception. So can you just elaborate on these two small points, please? Thank you very much. I'm Tanti Kazarika from New Delhi. Who would like to go first? Uh, this question is uh, for the Indian panelist. Well, the Indian panelist, I'm afraid, has yeah. had to leave. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I'll connect with her separately. Then. That's, that, that's, why, that's why I had to... Um, change the order of the speakers because she suddenly got urgently called away. Uh, but she very kindly agreed to stay and give her uh, address first. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry about All that because right. they, they were good questions. I think, I think the question generally about what amounts to personal information and uh, what constitutes personal information is a very difficult in one sense, all the speakers I've heard tonight have said the same thing, and that is the, their definitions talk about um, information that relates to an individual. In my country, the wording of legislation is slightly different. It talks about inv uh, information about an individual, and our federal court has given that a very narrow interpretation. So, in fact, our definition of personal information now is not as uh, comprehensive as it is in other jurisdictions. It's another reason why we're not GDPR compliant and another reason why the Australian legislation uh, is undergoing close scrutiny at the moment and is likely to be amended. Um, Sunil, you have your hand up. Uh, Dr. Gordon, uh, I have a question. Uh, I want to put this question to all panelists, um, and if it's uh, to Dr. Gordon, you as well. So, what are the steps taken by the jurisdictions 
uh, in your country is to develop transnational data protection law in the region. Because this is very important as far as the development of uh, data protection law in the region is concerned. Are you talking about sort of regional um, laws that are compat uh, compatible as between countries? Yeah. So I suppose the um, European Union has achieved that through the GDPR. Um, in my part of the world, the Asia Pacific, um, it hasn't happened. Our nearest neighbour of any size is New Zealand, and it has a totally different Privacy Act to ours. Um, I'm interested in relation to the other speakers. Are you aware of any initiatives to um, uh, make your laws uh, complementary to or identical with the laws of other countries in your region to make to make the law more universally applicable? Has there been any discussion about that? Well, uh, as for China, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, as you know, we have kind of a, um, pr a personal information protection law, PIPL, and PIPL uh, is uh, enacted um, following GDPR. So uh, those kind of uh, principles, concepts are more or less uh, the same with the GDPR. Uh, is is I think th this is uh, similar uh, to what you just mentioned in you know, a transnational uh, legislation. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I agree with that comment, um, Mr. Mori or Johannes. Do you, do you wish to add anything to that? Yes, I think uh, making a region like uh, GDPR in Europe in Asia is a great idea, and I hope. Uh, especially um, Chinese companies can transfer to Japan uh, personal information without governing uh, governmental assessment for security or personal <coughs> data and something. Um, but I think uh, that it's very difficult to make such a region in Asia because there are many different uh, court systems in every uh, countries, so there is probably totally different uh, to uh, situations in Europe. So um, there's many, many high hurdles, I think. Um, <clears throat> from from our perspective, at, at least in my personal opinion, um, um, sorry, if I understand the the, the question correctly, uh, Dr. Hughes, is that whether we could adopt a GDPR as is to Indonesia? Was that the question? Well, that's one possible scenario, yes. We're yeah. talking about making the law consistent as between multiple countries. Um, we, we are doing it. I mean, as I mentioned, um, our uh, bill, PDP bill, is heavily influenced by a GDPR, and the existing regulation does make uh, uh, significant references, references to GDPR, although not uh, completely. Um, um, perhaps the lawmakers uh, of Indonesia have thought about that and um, have discounted things that uh, they thought may not be relevant or uh, inapplicable, inapplicable in Indonesia. Now, we could make it as a, perhaps a multilateral treaty or, or of some sort and Indonesia be the uh, a signatory to that, it's, it is possible. But again, I would imagine that there could be exceptions uh, if that were to be the route for us to adopt and uh, comply with the uh, uh, ruling and uh, regulation, Dr. Hughes. I've known uh, Dr. Sunil who asked the question. I've known him for many years and he's been going on about this for a very long time. But I, I think the answer, Sunil, the practical answer is that the GDPR is partly achieving what you're talking about. Um, I think Mr. Worry was correct when he said that there's too many sort of nuances, or differences between countries in Asia and, and, and Europe to make it a totally 
worldwide applicable law, but probably there are elements of the GDPR which can be applied in virtually all jurisdictions. I think that's the inevitable outcome. Um, are you happy with that answer, Sunil? We're just about to run out of time. Yeah. Is there anything you'd like to add? Yes, it will be a way forward. Yes, thank you. Let's see that uh, how, how we can develop uh, some transnational uh, data protection law relevant to all countries in the world. We'll, uh, let's see that how to make our contribution from Asia. You can see that Dr. Sunil, yeah. is a, he's a big picture man. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have run out of time. Um, can I just mention as, as a quick advertisement on the way out, If you, a lot of people have stayed on this uh, webinar from start to finish, I which shows it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting topic. Yeah, the topic is very interesting to people. Yeah. There will be further discussion about this at the Law Asia Annual Conference, which is taking place in Sydney, Australia, between the 18th and the 21st of November. Um, We'd love you to come down and join in the conference as a whole and specifically participate in that session if you're interested. Um, that though brings me to an end of session two. I'd like to sincerely thank all of our speakers for their presentations. I, I thought each <coughs> presentation was absolutely excellent. And I know that I for one have learned a lot uh, sitting here listening to it and I'm sure that must apply to everyone in the audience as well. So thank you very much. And on that note, I'm going to hand us back now to the MC. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gordon. Uh, I have well understood the characteristic features of each jurisdiction. As uh, Mr. Morris said, uh, about the Japanese data protection issue, uh, it will be important to receive legal advice from the member of Tokyo Bar Association. Now the time for this interesting webinar has passed so quickly Finally, we'd like to move to closing remarks. Uh, this seminar is jointly held by uh, Logi and Tokyo Bar Association. So I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Sanil Abiyarani, our uh, chairperson of Communications, Technology and Data Protection Committee of Law Asia. Mr. Sanil, please give a closing remarks. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to all speakers, uh, moderators, and especially the Tokyo Bar to organize uh, this webinar. Special, my special thanks uh, go to uh, all the participants. Now, today that uh, we discussed about the classification of data into private and personal information, it's labor sensitive, it's essential as far as the level of privacy security relevant to data is concerned. And any civilized person on the earth feels that they must have confident individualism and reluctantly expose some information about him to the rest of the world. Take example, sexual behavior, suffering from disease, religious beliefs, etc. where all speakers discuss this uh, aspect. Under the development of, uh, as far as the development of ICT sector is concerned, especially um, as far as the cloud computing, big data and artificial intelligence are concerned, uh, the issues involved in the data protection become very complicated. As far as the technology is concerned, authentication systems, access control, cryptographic techniques, data alteration, whenever data is supplied to site, cookie filtering, anonymization, and dealing with only trusted parties are some precautions that a user can take with the support of technology to protect his privacy. The practical problem is how to declare the extent of technology support securing such personal data. The core issue here is how to decide the failure of the website vendors to provide the necessary technical support protecting the customer's data. So that is why we are so up to date. Uh, we couldn't find uh, any successful solution you only using technology for this aspect. So that is why we can see now the data protection, privacy rights versus right to information at the moment in the world. So there shall be balanced forces formulating privacy and data protection law, ensuring security of a country while it is necessary to build a democratic nation. All speakers discuss about GDPR. There are seven principles under GDPR, the lawless, uh, lawfulness, fairness, and transparency as a first principle we discussed, the purpose limitation, the data minimization, accuracy, storage limitation, integrity and confidentiality, especially security for their personal data and the accountability. All these seven principles discussed in a different way by all speakers uh, that uh, they have made their presentation today. It requires business to protect the personal data and privacy of European Union citizens for transactions that occur within EU uh, member states and non-compliance could cost companies clearly. 
Now, the first speaker, heading uh, one sent here, our German speaker, explained the privacy of GDPR briefly and the advantages and reasons for reluctant to accept GDPR to some business organization. And Shahai is uh, Shibua of uh, Japan, and Maria Conception um, uh, Simon Dekdok of the Philippines provided a very informative comparative analysis of data protection law in Japan and the Philippines with the GDPR. Young Wang explained how Singapore maintains data protection of people successfully uh, compared to GDPR. Henry Chan of China explained how China has developed data protection following GDPR and discussed operational risks under data protection. The current situation of data protection law and requirements beyond GDPR in India under the development of technology and decisions of the Supreme Court were discussed by Rinda Pandari. Uh, Jahan uh, Satafi Eagle of Indonesia explained the requirement to enact data protection law in Indonesia, adopting GDPR with case studies. Keita Mori of Japan explained the implementation mechanism of data protection in Japan. Now, as far as the situation in my country, Sri Lanka, is concerned that we have brand new data protection, personal data protection Act number uh, 9 of uh, 2022, uh, mainly following GDPR. As uh, the, when I put that question, whether the jurisdiction have made any contribution to develop uh, transnational uh, uh, data protection law, all give the one answer to the best thing to follow GDPR, like uh, the Sri Lanka followed the same. Uh, this is the situation why we can see different laws at the moment in Asian, Asia and uh, Asian and Asia Pacific region due to political reasons, economic strengths, continuation of traditional agriculture, development of industries and technology, involvement in international trade, involvement in international politics of the countries. Likewise, there are so many reasons uh, we can see that for, for uh, different uh, laws maintained by different jurisdictions. It is our vision to maintain uniformity among all countries to maintain data protection and privacy policies in the world and the region. Once again, thank you very much for all speakers. Uh, especially, my special thanks go to uh, K. Mitoshi San, uh, Dr. Gordon Hills, and uh, Montezu Heroes, our uh, moderators. Uh, thank you very much for unbearing efforts. On behalf of Loisia, I give a big thank to Tokyo Bar and all speakers, organizers, and who participated in this webinar. We had a very successful webinar. I can I saw one time there were more than 178 participants. So this will be the end of very successful uh, say webinar on data protection in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your kind and warm uh, closing remarks. Thank you so much. Uh, and all the moderators and speakers, uh, would you please turn your video on? Okay, Henning san would you please turn your video on? Yes, it's, I'm trying. <laughs> okay, Henning san is here. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, it's I can stopped. see it. <laughs> it's stopped. <laughs> okay. I'm not allowed to. I can't do it. <laughs> okay, no problem. Okay, uh, all the moderators and speakers, again, thank you so much for the great sessions. Also, thank you so much for all audiences joining today's webinar. I hope you all had a great time listening to our moderators and speakers. In closing this webinar, once again, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to all of you. Thank you so much. See you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi. Thank you for all. Thank you for all. Okay, please turn off your video. And uh, Mr. Tanaka, please uh, uh, end uh, this webinar. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, bye bye. Thank you, thank you. All the help given by you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Sanison, too. Thank you so much. Bye bye.